Maybe it's not activated. Um, Good morning. We are live from Council Chamber. We're just confirming one of the cameras is functioning. So just give us a minute. Um, good morning. Before we begin, I will go over the emergency response plan for this room. In an emergency, everyone must evacuate through the nearest safe exit. And I believe the clerk is, uh, Arlene is displaying the, the uh, safety map. Um, those seated in the gallery will today, everybody seated in council chambers will just take direction from myself as the meeting clerk, given that we're not open to the public yet. After evacuating the room, please proceed to a stairwell, take the stairs to the ground level and evacuate the building through the doors march, marked emergency exit and go to a muster point. Do not take an elevator or walk through the city room. Anyone with limited mobility should identify themselves to myself, the meeting clerk, during an evac evacuation. Uh, and please finally speak to myself if first aid is required. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clerk Ward. Uh, I would like to now call this meeting to order and uh, acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory as well as the Métis homelands and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Dakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, now settlers from around the world. Uh, roll call of council colleagues, Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Okay, she's there, okay. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. 
Council Salvador. Good morning. Council Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Xin yin kuai le. Ah. Okay, uh, adoption of the agenda. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Uh, I'll move that the February 12th, 2024 special city council meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. The addition of item 3.1, uh, explore Edmonton financial support requests and 3.3 actions to respond to housing and houseless emergency. Second. And second by Councillor Rice, please vote. I'm yes. Thank you, Councillor Rice. We're just waiting on one vote. Councillor Rutherford. I voted in East Scribe. So yes. Yes, thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried protocol items. Councillor Rice. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mayor Sohi. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's my honor to acknowledge and celebrate the Lunar New Year, which began on February 10th. Lunar New Year occurs annually on the new moon of the first lunar month, and to my Chinese culture, it's one of the most important holidays we celebrate. However, it is also important occasion marked across many Asian countries, including Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines, South Korea, Singapore, Thailand, Japan, and Indonesia. Well, each of those countries mark the occasion in their own way. They all share the common focus around the importance of the family. Lunar New Year is a time to gather with family and friends and to wish each other good luck and for the year that lies ahead. Also, the traditions that mark this important day are very, very, uh, very uh, different. From big banquet meals with friends and family and to giving your home a deep clean to start the year fresh, to sharing uh, monetary, uh, monetary gifts in red, in red envelope as a sample of good luck. Many people mark the Lunar New Year in their own way. For me, it's also an occasion to share in the unique tradition of Chinese culture and show pride and in our diversity, and to celebrate the many viable contributions of Edmonton's Asian community. In thinking about contributions, I would like to recognize the following members of the Asian community for their leadership and the many contributions. Mr. Heron Fan and for his work with the Edmonton Chinatown Multicultural Center. Mr. Ben Yan, ben Yan Wan, and for his varied work as a business owner, past the president of ONCE Association of Edmonton and the host of the 2002 and the 2017 ONCE National Conventions in Edmonton. Mr. Donald Folkman Ma for his work with the Ma Society of Edmonton for the past 40 years. Mr. Dao Wu Chen and for his work as the president of the Fukunus Association of Alberta since 2018. Mr. Dong Ning for his work as the president of the East China Immigrant Society of Edmonton. Ms. Gloria Gao and for her work as the president of the Immigration Community Alberta Late Work Association and volunteering with the Minor Hockey Association and the Assist Community Services Center. 
Mr. Yue Dong Dao, and for his work as the president of the Chinese Senior Dramatic Club of Edmonton. Thank you for all those community members and leaders, your dedication and contribution to our Asian communities in our city. Well, there are many ways to celebrate Lunar New Year. Also represents the opportunity to reflect on the past year and the dream of the possibilities for the next year. In reflection, I'm proud of the work our Edmond Chinese community has accomplished to create a welcoming environment that contributes to our city's overall vibrancy, diversity, and economic success. 2024 is the year of the dragon, and we honor and welcome the dragon's power and strength and good fortune. I'm hopeful and optimistic for the year that lies ahead, and I wish you nothing but the best. On behalf of the city of Edmonton and Edmontonians, may you all have successful and prosperous new year. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. It's done. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, and it was uh, phenomenal to actually see a number of uh, uh, community organizations coming together to uh, celebrate Lunar Year uh, in, uh, in Edmonton. I had the chance to attend at least four of those celebrations. Uh, uh, you know, two, one at Kingsway Mall, one at Western Mental Mall, and uh, then Dynasty uh, Restaurant that was also organized by some young people from the uh, from the Chinese community, such a dynamic group of people, and also the uh, reception hosted by the uh, uh, the Consul General uh, uh, Zhao, right? So it was so nice to see community celebrating a mark. That's very important. Thank you so much, Consul Rice, for recognizing those efforts. Uh, with that, any other protocol items? I see none. Uh, now, select items for debate. Before we do that, I just want to run by, because this has been a little bit scattered agenda. We're trying to bring it together. So I just want to make sure that we all understand there were a number of items that we were actually, that were discussed at committee. So if there's a need to select, we can select them. If not, then uh, we shouldn't, right? So. Uh, uh, 3.2 was discussed at the executive committee, uh, Al Mustafa Academy. Uh, also, uh, mm, and uh, bylaw 20678 to implement clean energy improvement program was also discussed at the executive committee. So, just for our knowledge, uh, Councillor Stevenson, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to su uh, select uh, three one, um, and I can select uh, three three and three four, which must be selected as well. Three 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 four. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to select uh, four six, not for discussion, but just to move a subsequent. Okay, four six to move subsequent. Okay, and I would like to select. 4.4 and 4.5 because they're new dealt together. All right, can some move, someone move the balance, please? So moved. Thank you. Second. Yes, second. Councillor Stevenson, please vote. I'm yes. Thank you, Councillor yes. Rice. Councillor Rutherford, yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. 
that is carried. Uh, can you please, uh, Clerk Ward, read, uh, uh, tell us what we have already approved? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. This morning, City Council has passed the recommendations in the following report without debate. Um, item 3.2, Al Mustafa Academy and Humanitarian Society support with outstanding tax balance. Okay. Okay. Uh, request to speak. We have uh, a request to speak on two items, but uh, as the procedures we follow, we don't hear from members of the public at, uh, at council meetings. I would uh, uh, ask that we continue to follow that. Uh, uh, that uh, um, precedent, right? So, uh, okay, good, all right, thank you. Vote on bylaws not select for debate. Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I will move first reading of items 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3. Second. That was Councillor Rice? Right. Okay, thank you. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move second reading of item 4.1. Second. Second by Councillor Stevenson. Please vote. Yes. Thank you. Was that Councillor Rutherford? Yes, it was. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move consideration of third reading of item 4.1. Second. Second. Councillor Stevenson, thank you. Oh, Councillor Rice. Okay, Councillor Rice, uh, please vote. Yes. Sorry, I'm just re-logging in. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Rutherford. We're just loading the vote now. It would just be a minute. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor so if you all move third and final reading of bylaw 20705. Okay. Second. Second by Councillor Rice, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. Okay, so next we have public reports. All right, so we already dealt with the, the first item, 4.1, and then we go to our Second item of business, which is explore admin of financial support request selected by Councillor Stevenson, and I'll go to administration for a presentation. Uh, we don't have a presentation, but I think um, Stacy has a couple of introductory remarks. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Good morning. So this report here before you today is uh, brought brought by administration as a result of Explore Edmonton's request to the shareholder. As the items are financial in nature, they need to be approved by city council. Um, and joining me today are a number of individuals um, 
with Explore Edmonton. And so maybe I'll turn it over to Tracy Bednard just to introduce the delegation. Are they there? Uh, I don't see Tracy, but there's a number of individuals from Explore Edmonton. So maybe I'll just quickly uh, go through. I think Tracy had just joined. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Oh, Tracy, I just was wondering if you'd like to introduce the delegation with you today, please. Thank you. I appreciate that. We uh, just have our board chair, Karn Oshry, who, if she's not here, she will be joining. Amir Kazani, who leads finance. Arlindo Gomes, who leads the venues and um, uh, our key events. And uh, to address questions or any questions that might be uh, arising around stakeholder consultation, we have Barney Yerksa, who is the chair of the Edmonton Destination Marketing Hotel Group. Thank you, Stacey. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I will go to Councillor Salvador. I think she has a, a motion to be put forward on the floor. Councillor Salvador. Uh, <clears throat> thanks so much. Um, yes, yeah, so I do have a motion. I'll move it right off the bat here. Uh, so I'll move that the 2024 operating budget for Explore Edmonton <clears throat> be increased by $6,011,000 on a one-time basis with funding from the Financial Stabilization Reserve as follows, $991,000 to fund insurance, util utilities, loan pay repayments, and property taxes due to the City of Edmonton in Q1 2024, and $5,020,000 to fund the base operations of Explore Edmonton in 2024. Uh, point two, that the City of Edmonton enter a grant funding agreement not to exceed $6,011,000 between the City of Edmonton and Explore Edmonton with terms and conditions acceptable to the City Manager. I'll second that. Uh, can you make the introduction, please? And also, can we put the motion on the... Uh, we, we don't have that motion, so if somebody... Oh, can you can share that, please, us, Councilor please. Salvador, with the clerk so we can have all see it? Oh, yeah. I... Uh, I'll share it. It's in the chat. Okay, well, while, okay, that, um, while that is being done, can you make the introduction, please? Yeah, absolutely. So the purpose of this motion is really to provide Explore Edmonton with stable and predictable funding for the remainder of the year and to set ourselves up to have a much more focused discussion on Explore's base funding on a go-forward basis when we come back to this conversation in a few weeks' time. Uh, from my perspective, uh, moving forward with three now and potentially another three come SOBA uh, does leave Explore with a higher degree of uncertainty uh, as to how to plan their upcoming year. So uh, unfortunately, I think the approach of three now and maybe three later um, ignores the realities of the industry where lead time is really needed to plan uh, and some degree of surety is needed to secure partners and other funders. Um, and as we all know, during the pandemic, we asked Explore to deplete the reserves uh, and made a commitment to sorting things out as we recovered from the economic shock. Uh, now, now that those reserves are depleted, um, six million is still far below what was requested by Explore Edmonton to fulfill their current mandate, but it will at least allow them to execute their priorities and retain critical events that Edmontonians have come to love and expect. Um, Furthermore, it also provides stable backing of the city so that Explore can go out and find matching funding from other sources. And I think that's just important to highlight uh, when we think about how much economic activity is leveraged from others by our investment. Uh, so I will leave it there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Now we have a motion on the uh, on the floor. It's uh... Is displayed and we can ask questions on the motion and we can ask questions to administration and the delegation on broad issues related to Explore Edmonton. With that, I'm going to go to Councillor Councillor Salvador. Do you have questions or can I go? Feel free to go to others. Okay, Councillor Cartmel, go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. Thank you. So um, there was I there was a motion that I put forward back at uh, budget in December. Uh, that overlaps uh, a fair bit with this motion. And so I guess I'm wondering what the status of that motion previous, previously made is or was and how that's going to change here. 
So maybe I'll start, uh, Councillor Cartmel. Uh, so there were a number of motions relating to Explore Edmonton. Um, it's our intention that regardless of the outcome of today, you will still receive the information that you requested with the spring SOBA. So there was two pieces in the one motion I'm thinking of. One was with respect to the master plan of the exhibition lands. And the other was with respect to the sports groups that are uh, working to uh, put a bit of a center of excellence together in uh, halls A, B, and C at the Agricom. And uh, I saw those two things as working um, hand in hand with future additional grant funding to explore. So if this passes today, um, then what? Uh, are we losing those other two pieces? Or are we just, uh, you know, where from here? Because I'm, I'm frankly, I'm lost and I feel, uh, um, you know, there was a particular purpose to the motion I made, which I understood was supported. And now I think that purpose is being lost if, if one part of the motion is essentially advancing and the other two parts aren't. So I'm, uh, I'm not sure what to think, frankly. So maybe I'll just, this particular motion um, is for one-time funding. So in my view, you would still, we would still bring you all the other pieces of information that you've asked for so that you can make the ongoing funding decisions at the appropriate time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Cardinal, Councilor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much, and thanks to the mover for putting the motion on the floor. Um, yeah, maybe just a few questions um, first First, to explore. Uh, can you remind me the portion of uh, Explore Edmonton's budget that is directly funded by, by the city funding compared to what you're able to leverage with, with other partners and orders of government? Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, over Overall, if we look at 2023 as an example year, and that's when uh, the City of Edmonton funded the 11-7 plus 5, um, we, we were able to internally generate or find matching funds for, um, you, you invested 20% of that total budget for Explore Edmonton. The rest we were able to generate through internal cash and also through matching from Travel Alberta, uh, from the federal government. And I would also note that the hotel group has committed a four year funding commitment Great. for $6 million uh, per year to try to uh, support your investment and also demonstrate the predictable, st sustainable uh, priority for us. Amazing. And and that, I assume, is going to be work that you will continue to, to do in terms of exploring those other partnerships, looking for other funding opportunities, as you've already done, to, to quite a high success, correct? Yes, and we feel that, that, that that's the expectation that you have on us. So right. one of the challenges with a reduction in a city dollar is that we're not able to leverage that uh, through other partners. And, and I should have also noted private corporate investors that we seek to help fund specifically a lot of the events that uh, that we bring into Edmonton. Great. Well, you know, we, we did have a conversation um, uh, or, you know, there have been conversations in the past just around, you know, the, the potential need or opportunities to look at um, you know, mandate priorities, just wanting to confirm that those strategic conversations are going to continue so that we can, you know, really, really uh, maximize the value that Explore Edmonton brings. Yes, I, I, you know, I can speak for our board and management. That is something that uh, is the priority for us. And I think that it ties to Councillor Cartmel's previous question. Uh, while this provides some um, opportunity for the ability for us to really tread water this year and not eliminate all of those programs. It does not change uh, the, the opportunity that mm -hmm. council and the board and, and we will be taking to ensure that the programming is matching the investment on a predictable basis. Great, great. That's really helpful. Well, maybe uh, just in my last couple of minutes, shifting to our, our city staff, you know, I've been thinking in terms of, you know, return on investment, um, and I, I'm thinking even in two ways. One is sort of in tax tax revenue, um, and then also some of the financial liabilities we face with our with our venues. 
Um, so Ms. Padbury, wondering if you could give a sense, again, recognizing that there's a lot of diffuse mechanisms, that it's not a one-for-one -one return, um, but I was thinking about the important role that, that Explore Edmonton plays in our hotel industry and how that in turn impacts um, the, the distribution of, of tax in our city. Do you have any information you could share around, uh, you know, the tax revenue that we we gain from the hotel industry and how that has changed, let's say, over the past five years or so? So maybe I'll just start off just um, as a reminder that uh, taxes, the, those assessed values will impact the distribution of taxes, but not the overall amount of taxes collected. Yeah. And with that, I think I'll pass the more detailed aspect of the question to Mr. Zabo or Ms. Watt, who are online. Uh, thank you, uh, DCM Peppery, and thank you for the question, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, the city of Edmonton, like most uh, major cities across North America, has seen in its hotel sector a uh, pronounced decline in valuation, um, largely as the result of travel restrictions and uh, a lack of movement throughout the Corona 19, uh, sorry, COVID 19 pandemic. Um, we have not returned to anywhere near the uh, value that uh, hotels used to. Um, hold within our city. And um, so, I mean, the, out, the outlook at the moment is uh, on the tax side, uh, hotels is, is still substantially less of the overall non-residential tax base than, than it used to hold. Great. I'll, I'll come back for a few more questions, but I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Constable Stevenson. Constable Rice. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mayor. Uh, Explore Edmonton uh, is one of our key driver for our city's economic uh, revenue, and I, I think this is uh, something is uh, really important, and our city needs to look into it very carefully. Um, so my question is about the first one uh, for FSR, and because they, that is a funding source we are from. Uh, what is the capacity right now our city's FSR? are for the current state? So the current balance of the financial stabilization reserve is 140 million. Uh, the current minimum balance, which will be adjusted at, um, after we do all the financial close for the 2023 year end. But the minimum balance before that is 123, $123.5 million. Um, but I would just uh, remind council that we offer, we do, we are running a deficit this year. And so we do anticipate that the FSR will be roughly $40 million below its minimum balance. Um, and again, that's just a rough estimate because I don't have the financial, the final numbers for 2023 year end. Um, and in accordance with your strategy, you'd have to, uh, in accordance with your policy, you'd have to bring back a strategy to bring yourself back up to the minimum balance within three years. Okay, uh, thank you for that information. That means our financial uh, situation for our city and is still under that challenge situation. <clears throat> so the next question um, to uh, Tracy, to specifically, and if for this almost one, one million, um, 991,000 funding, uh, covers portion of property tax due to the city in Q1 2004. Do you have specific that break down how much and for that property tax? And in this money we provided to cover that. Yeah, yeah so I, this would be property taxes for only uh, the Expo Center and I'll go to again to either Ms. Watt or Anton. If you want me to grab that one. So yeah, just to be clear, the property tax component there relates to the convention center. Uh, this is both for the municipal amount. Actually, in this case, I think the 38,000 includes education amounts because this is a grant or you know money that you're providing. We're essentially proposing to fund uh, that portion rather than forgive it. So in historical approaches, we've said, we don't really forgive education taxes or remitted. But in this case, they're asking us to fund uh, the full amount of taxes. So 
is really just the convention center. The convention center primarily is exempt from property taxes. The only component that is taxable is when there is a liquor event taking place. So under the legislation, if there is liquor being served at an event, that's when uh, they become taxable. And so we work with Explore Edmonton on an annual basis to ensure we know what those events are, when those events are happening. And then we do a prorated calculation based on the full value of the convention center to come to the taxable status. So the 38,000 actually represents less than 1% of the taxes um, to the property. That is why my question come in. And because, thank you for that information. Um, that my next question is about, and then why specific reason and our city needs pay and for other type of like loan repayments and the utilities and the insurance. So is there any specific policy and to cover for cities, ABCs, like agency boards and the commissions to, to cover all those type of payments? And will that set precedent for other organizations come back to our city to ask the same coverage? So uh, there is nothing in policy that uh, prevents council from doing this. Um, I th this, what you see before you today, um, the 991,000 and then previously uh, the number, the ask was for $2,020,000. So a total of $3 million was the ask from Explore Edmonton. So we have simply conveyed what the ask was from Explore Edmonton in this report. Okay, so I, I have more questions. Come, I will come next second round. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering to the mover, um, the additional three million over and above what's recommended in the report. Um, what's that for? Yeah. Thanks so much. And sorry, that was to the mover, right? Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, so this really goes back to um, identifying the gap <clears throat> that Explore shared with um, with us initially. So the, the full 6 million would essentially allow for Explore to, to tread water or to maintain um, existing programming. Uh, and you might want to direct us to explore for details, but my understanding is that um, simply doing the three million would actually result uh, in in a number of tough tough conversations and decisions around programming, um, and potentially the elimination of uh, programming that currently exists. Uh, so the six million is really just about treading water and, and maintaining um, stability and and that ba um, base level of programming that uh, Edmontonians would expect going forward. Um, but again, it, it is. Uh, by no means precluding that future conversation about what that base should look like going forward. It really is about um, providing surety for this year. Okay, thank you. And I guess then to Ms. Bednard, um, yeah, can you just uh, maybe expand a little bit more on that? Um, and then I was also wondering, um, you did, I think you outlined pretty well um, sort of what your plans are going forward with Councillor Stevenson's question, but um, yeah, if you could just maybe let me know the, the financial situation, why you need that extra three. Yeah, so uh, the, the intent is to align the current programs and funding with investments and, um, and a long-term predictable match to that. And we don't currently have that. So over the last few years, uh, council invests or has invested 11.7 annually as its base and then in the fall also committed uh, an additional funding package that enabled um, from between 17 million to 22 million dollars annual investment from the city of Edmonton. So the difference in 2023 was the 11.7 continues into 2024, but there was no commitment to the additional uh, investment. Councillor Cartmel had raised a motion to consider that in April. Um, and from Explore Edmonton's perspective, we are not able to continue the programs without, uh, without that $6 million. Uh, collectively, that still represents less than we have invested in our programs previously. But as we 
as we described to you, we've undertaken our own OP12 initiative. Uh, we've made cuts and, and delays, um, but the additional six is what would be required just to keep the base operation and allow us the time to have that longer term discussion around ensuring that the programming and the mandate of our Explore Edmonton does match with the predictable sustainable funding. Okay, thank you. And so that would mean like things like K Days, Farm Fair International could be in, in jeopardy of of not going going forward for 2024. Um, it, it could. The, the reality is, uh, you invest the least in that. Uh, significantly, the impacts are on the loss of business that we are able to attract into Edmonton. Um, so, of course, the administration leads. Uh, discuss the reduction in tax. Explore Edmonton uniquely is out in the national and international markets bringing in conferences and events. Although those don't drive revenue to Explore Edmonton, they do put people in hotels and restaurants and uh, bring money into the economy. So I would, I would articulate that that is the most significant impact to uh, not not just Explore Edmonton, but to uh, the business and the economic impacts in the city. Okay, that, that's wonderful. Um, I've got a few seconds left. I just, Miss Watt, you were, you were talking about property tax um, for, for those hotels, but the property tax isn't tied to the vacancy rate or anything like that. It's on the value of the, the property, correct? But does the vacancy rate reduce the value of the property? Yes, yes, Councillor, okay. it does. Um, one of the most important factors in an income approach, which is what we use on hotels, is vacancy. Uh, so the vacancy does absolutely bring down the value of uh, those properties uh, and their assessments. Okay, thank you very much. My time's up. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Rice, can you take the chair, please? Yes. Taken. I'll just follow up on Councillor Wright's questions, uh, uh, Kate. Uh, are we seeing the, uh, it is very important that we bring back the, uh, the tax base in the, in the hotel, in hotel industry by attracting more conventions and visitors to fill those rooms. Are we seeing a trend upwards now or uh, uh, we are? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, we are um, seeing a rebound finally this year. Um, Anton has some figures for us. Uh, our tax revenue from hotels in 2020 was 18.2 million. Um, it dipped to as low as 9.3 in 2023. And this year it has, has rebounded to 12.6 uh, million. Mm -hmm. So we, sorry, it, in millions. Um, so we, we still have a ways to go, but uh, we're definitely seeing an upswing this year over, uh, over the last number of pandemic years. Got it. And a question to our guest from the, the hotel industry that are part of the delegation. Uh, how do you see the ongoing investments in tourism conventions critical to that continuous rebounding back of the of the of the industry and the and the tax base thank you mr mayor for for uh, the question um, the work that explore does around the large conventions um, it not only puts additional occupancies in our hotels um, from the compression that it creates in the city but it also creates um, higher average daily rates that can be charged which um, also have a significant impact on the profit and loss statements of, of our properties, which impacts the valuations of the hotels, because at the end of the day, the, the valuations are about the bottom line mm -hmm. and how, we, um, how much uh, profit or loss that we generate at these hotels. So it has a direct correlation to, to, those, um, to those properties. So it, um, it's significant and, and not only the conference itself, but the impact that it has of just getting people into the city and then seeing what we have and being able to come back on their own for leisure um, travel after the events that they, they come and attend. So not only just the one-off events, but it also has an impact, longing impact um, from a leisure travel perspective. 
And thank you for that, because the sooner we recover, less burden there is on other properties, because tax gets shifted from one property to the other for a city to keep its uh, overall requirements, what we need. Uh, I'll go to uh, uh, guest uh, uh, Tracy Bernard. I, if I understand correctly, there were certain responsibilities that were transferred over to Explore Edmonton uh, uh, that are direct, indirectly related to tourism as well. But I think, for example, the running of Expo Center was not in your portfolio or uh, K-Days or other. Can you, can you walk me through, like, what were some of the added responsibilities that were transferred to you? And did money follow at the same time that responsibilities were transferred to you from the city? Thank you. So there, there were added responsibilities. Um, and just to give you uh, an idea of impact, for example, the total program expenses of the former Northlands assets, so K-Days, Farm Fair, a rodeo, the total expenses are $27 million. However, we are able to fund most of those through internally generated cash. Um, and so there is uh, there is a tax levy required for that, but it's very modest compared to what we're able to, to generate. Um, I would also note with the two venues that the Expo Center came online subsequent to the Convention Center. And if you, if you look at the management that we've been able to provide for those, we've been able to drive down maintenance, operating expenses, cost of goods, um, and, and, almost recover from COVID, mm -hmm. but those venues do operate at a deficit and it is why that municipalities um, have the responsibility of operating venues in their cities. Got it, got it. Because that's what I'm trying to understand because I think sometimes we make decisions where transfer, we transfer responsibility but we don't transfer the funding at the same time or allocate the funding at the same time. This is a challenge that I have seen over and over again. Uh, I'm going to come back on the efforts to make those venues self-reliant. Well, I'll come back uh, for the second round. And I'll take the chair back. Uh, I'll move the second round, actually. I'll move the second round. Second. Uh, please vote for the second round. Um, yes. Thank you, Councillor Rice. We have all the votes. Uh, <laughs> please display votes. That's his carry. His return the chair to you, Ms. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Rice. I'll go to Councillor Stevenson. Great. Actually, I think my colleagues have really touched on a lot of the, the points. So just to reiterate again, we've seen sort of a six million, roughly six million dollar drop uh, from 2020 in terms of uh, tax tax revenue from hotels and again it's not it's not lost revenue but that's that's put on to other other businesses in the commercial tax base great um, then just in terms of uh, you know the mayor has touched on sort of the the financial liability that we have as owners of the Expo Center and the Convention Center also just want to touch on I mean we my memory is that we've made some pretty significant capital investments in these buildings recently as well is that I don't know if anyone can speak to to that number? Uh, that's correct. Uh, we've made the capital profile um, for the Expo Center rehabilitation is $104 million. So we've made some significant investments. Wow, I actually did not know that the number was gonna be that high. Um, and that's, that's exhibition only. And then we also have some investments at the convention center as well. So um, Great. You know, I think that actually covers. Oh, just a, to administration. You note in the in the report that you'll be looking for information. You'll be reviewing an annual plan that's submitted by Explore Edmonton. Just wondering what the key stra strategies or priorities that you have that you'll be looking for in that annual plan. Sorry, that's to administration. Mm -hmm. It's just. I think when. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, when we when we look at that plan, what we'd be looking for is to make sure that the business plan is designed to achieve the mandate that's been set for Explore Edmonton. Okay, well, 
okay, because we've had we've had some conversations about sort of the the original mandate and then maybe some add-ons. So is it going to be a lens sort of looking at that very core mandate, or um, how are we dealing with some of the maybe some of the additional um, additions to the work that they do that was maybe beyond their initial mandate? No, I'm, I'm not sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. There you are. Okay, sorry. Uh, I just lost connection there for a bit. Um, so would you mind repeating the question, Councillor? Oh, yeah, no, of course. Um, so you mentioned sort of reviewing their their business plan to ensure that it will achieve their um, mandate. And just wanted to, to dig into that a little bit, recognizing that we've had some conversation about you know, there's maybe an original mandate, then potentially some some additional um, add-ons that have have created some challenges. So, just wondering what lens administration will take when looking at that. So we'd be looking for are they doing are they performing the destination marketing uh, requirements under their mandate? Are they operating the convention centers? And those are the two, and I maybe defer to Mr. Corbold, but those are the two larger aspects of their mandate. And then we'd look at the signature events that are being um, undertaken. Great, great. Okay, that's wonderful. Really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate everyone's work on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you. I guess just to the mover, um, you know, like literally this is, is one of the first council meetings we've had since our fall SOBA meeting in which, you know, as Councillor Cartmel pointed out, we did have the motion that talked about debating this in spring. And, you know, at that time at the fall budget with all the other competing priorities, you know, council did discuss this and made an intentional decision to not. So I'm just wondering what, why now and like why is this coming forward now and why are, like it just feels like not good process so, so maybe, what are your thoughts on that um i'll start and then mr corbold can maybe weigh in i think sorry, that's, I that's think to the mover, mover i think it's to the mover. oh sorry yeah it's to the mover yeah um thanks so much for the question um yeah so on my end i think for me, it's really about having a fulsome understanding of what the implications of, of not moving forward uh, with this funding would be. Um, of course, during during budget, um, there was an ask from Explore uh, that was in written form. Um, I think following further discussions with Explore Edmonton um, and understanding uh, just how just how much change could come if if we are not willing to move forward with this at this time. Um, that's what uh, really prompted me to move forward with with a higher degree of urgency um, and and having a better grasp on just the planning and lead time that's needed for a lot of the work that Explore does, uh, whether that is trying to, you know, follow through on commitments for, for event bids that have sometimes multi-year lead times um, and multi-year programming. Uh, so that's what it was for me, is, is gaining that better understanding. Yeah, and Councilor Rutherford, I'll just add, the reason we put the report together is that that was kind of what we felt was intended by the shareholder after the shareholder meeting in January, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, I understand. I'm just trying to, so I guess, Tracy, can you outline more to the public uh, what's at stake if this d did wait until the spring SOBA to debate? Yes, so and, that, and the, so that the public has that understanding too. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, and I think um, what has not changed and is of absolute priority to us, the board administration, to council, to the shareholder, is the longer term discussion around what is the mandate and what is the funding and how do we consider that on a more predictable basis so sort of solving the issue that comes up every year when we approach council so so uh, that it that is maintained and that is a key priority for us in the interim uh, without any additional certainty or commitment of funding we would need to take actions that would permanently impact the visitor economy. So we would need to cancel programs, remove ourselves from bids, uh, remove ourselves from sales processes, 
And um, that is not something we could recover if we waited until until uh, April. So really the this is this is a temporary stabilization to enable us the time and process to have that bigger discussion and decision. Okay, that helps clarify for me. Thank you very much. Those are all my questions, um, um, Mayor Sohi. Thank you, Councillor <coughs> Rutherford. Councillor uh, Councillor Tang, sorry. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, I guess, Tracy, can you just, on that last point, can you just help me can, really- Can you speak up, Councillor Tang, please? Oh, yes, can you hear me okay? Yeah, wouldn't mind if you could just move a little close to the whatever mic you have, because it's- Okay, I'm on my phone, one second. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead now, please. Um, okay, can, can, is this better? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, so I guess question to, to, to Tracy, if you can just like on that last point, help me really fully grasp um, with the stabilization funding and the longer term conversation about a predictable funding model, you know, are we still gonna expect another conversation at fall Silva? You know, um, is that, or even next year, you know, what, what can I expect later on? Yes, thank you. Uh, the, so no, I mean, our priority is to align the funding with the programming and the board wants to do that with the shareholder so that there's an alignment and we can plan this predictably. And I would just point to our track record around that. Uh, we worked with Edmonton Destination Marketing Hotels a couple of years ago and um, we, we committed to a four-year uh, funding package that they invest in Explore Edmonton, and we work in partnership with them to put that investment into play. But we also have to demonstrate the returns on that, um, and that would be the relationship that we have with you. Uh, if there are if there are one-off items that come up, um, just as we do with EDMH or we've done with you, if there was some major bid, if there was a major international bid, something like that we would work in partnership with administration and, and we would approach you. But the first intent of us is to uh, agree with council on our mandate, fund whatever that mandate is, and that becomes the predictable funding. And we're able to enter into markets knowing that we can make a commitment for four years or whatever is required for that bid based on that level of funding. So. Okay, that that is helpful. And so by let's say you know once we can get through this next bid by fall, we should have a pretty you know all that work will be happening, and we should be having a pretty good sense of what will happen year after year, right? That's correct. And I think that I think what we can do, we spend a lot of time together, and um, I think what we can do once we have that predictable funding is do take that take that energy and continue to work with other funders to to invest because we also have that that strength and confidence so i uh, you know that's where we see realigning our time we think we can find additional investments but we need this to be predictable we need to know what that amount is so that we can then find that appropriate matching um, into the long term similar to what we did counselor with the nighttime economy strategy that was mm -hmm. just a council we didn't ask you for funding we went and found the funder for that that's right. Um, and earlier you had mentioned the the matching investments, say from EDMH, um, and you know if if this motion had you know waited or whatever during spring or didn't happen at all, then fundings like that could also be in jeopardy. Is that right? Yeah, that that's that's accurate because we the, uh, we take a dollar from you and we we go and match that with other levels whether whether it's the provincial government whether it's EDMH and we need that collective pot to be able to be successful in in bids and and programming for example. Yeah, yeah. So all this you know signals really uh, a critical importance of that predictability down the road and 
avoid having to come back year after year. Okay, that's all my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Constantine. Constantine Reyes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, specifically for the base operation, because for this $6 million and almost $5 million goes to base operation, can you tell me uh, what is your current base operations budget? Yeah, I mean, we would we would adjust that base. We adjust that base operation depending on our various investments. But um, a base of a ninety million dollar um, operating budget, which allows us to do our destination development and marketing, bid attraction, operate venues, and uh, operate and produce K days, farm fair, etc. That's at a full cost of about uh, ninety million dollars, and. Um, we require about one fifth, slightly less than that, based on this this ask, to enable that full budget from the city of Edmonton. Um, so then, my question go back to administration uh, because this six million dollars were take from the funding source FSR, where FSR is already has some challenge there. Um, what is our city's the first quarter? And because the timeline between the asking now and asking is spring soba is just this one quarter difference, the three months difference. I want to know the priority right now, our city. Uh, what is our current priority? <clears throat> if we take six million dollars and from FSR, and what impact could for the city's current operation priorities? So, Ms. Kobo or Ms. Padbury? Oh, I, I guess I could, I mean, I think it's a good question, Counselor. I think we, we often get, well, there's a long list of priorities, I guess, as I would say, that we're asking to consider all the time. So, I think more, more of that will come to light as we work through the OP12 report next week, but um, we, we certainly have priorities and we're going to talk about a big one today which is housing as well um, so there's lots of competing demands and as usual okay. these are all always tough decisions so yeah okay okay if that is the case I want to go back to Tracy Beverard. Uh specifically uh, we're talking about stability and the matching between program and the funding and because with that additional uh, mandate uh, or scope of your duties changed uh, but based on the funding funding purpose listed outline in this in this motion, and how that reflect the principle or the concept that you mentioned about the programming and, and the funding match. And because the, to me this is more about repay uh, repay something like property tax, loan loan uh, repayment, insurance facility, and mostly is base operation. So can you? Give me more information how that aligned to your uh, program and to the funding. Yes, so um, so when the initial, with the initial uh, motion that Councillor Cartmel made to come back in April, uh, that if if that had been successful, that would have enabled us to continue to manage although at a modest level, all three lines of business. So that 6 million enables the destination development and the venues and the, and the K-Days Farm Fair. Uh, with, the, with the $3 million that Explore Edmonton had originally asked for consideration at this meeting, it was really to just deal with some of those base operating costs to buy us some time to that additional uh, consideration in April. But all of these things are awkward, awkward mechanisms. Mm -hmm. if, if we were able to have some certainty around the 6 million today, it allows us to continue to operate the venues and those other components, but then puts us immediately into the longer term discussion that I think Councillor Cartmel and others had intended around um, what is required to match the programming with the consistent base funding from the city. So 
to you, to the organization, to explore and make this six million dollars at this moment, and from what I heard, is necessary and for you and to to move to move forward to the next step. So is that understanding correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rice. Councilor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My first question is to administration. Uh, for Councilor Cartnell's uh, motion uh, that to come for the unfunded service package to come back to the spring SOBA, would, would that have been um, one-time funding or would that have been just like the, is like the base add $6 million to the base ongoing? Um, I think it would have been it, the service package It's hard for me to answer that because the service package, we would have brought back $6 million, but I'm not sure without doing the other work, what the out years of that service package would have looked like. So there was likely that a component would have been one time and a component would have been ongoing, but until we do that other piece of work, I'm not sure what that service package would have looked like in totality. Okay. So you said you are still doing that piece of work. Councillor Cartmel's motion, is that correct? That's correct. We'd still continue with the work um, on the motions, the subsequent motions that were tabled during the budget. Okay. So then part of Councillor Cartmel's motion then would not be valid, I would assume, because it says increase um, Explore Edmonton budget by $6 million in 2024. Yes, so if if this were to pass today, um, I think we wouldn't bring forward that piece of the motion. We would just identify that that had been completed by this particular motion today. Okay, all right. So it's not like it would be increasing $12 million at Spring Soba. That's correct. Okay, uh, and then to the mover, did you, did you work on this motion with Councillor Cartmel? Just because they're very similar motions, it, did you work together on creating this motion? Yeah, thanks for the question, Councillor Principe. Uh, no, I um, quite honestly saw the report uh, was reflecting on uh, all of the conversations that we've had around the Explore Edmonton table. And um, again, identifying that uh, there would be some some pretty significant implications if we don't move this sooner rather than later. Um, I, I changed the amount from the $3 million to the $6 million. Um, and uh, given the conversations that we've had previously around uh, Councillor Cartmel's motion, which, uh, of course, I was supportive of, um, I, yeah, thought there'd be some, some good alignment, um, which is why I put it forward today. Thank you. Those are my only questions. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Principal. Councillor Rice, can you take the chair, please? Yes, chair is taken. Yeah. So I just want to follow up uh, on uh, to explore Edmonton. Like, is there opportunities to make both venues fully cost recovery. I know that I'm, I think you're doing good work on um, recovering as much as you can now, because I think, you, I think your cost recovery is significant uh, based on the, uh, the numbers I saw. And I think there'll, there'll be good information to share publicly as well, right? So are there opportunities to make them completely off tax levy? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, so first, first, I, I do want to acknowledge uh, the, the oversight of the venue management. Uh, together with those, those venues, even with inflation and with all of the increases, we've been able to drive down costs, including maintenance and repairs, payroll, uh, food costs, and those things. So I, I think from uh, an efficiency perspective, that is an advantage that managing both of those venues deliver. The other strategic advantage is that um, we use both of, we use one sales team to sell both of those venues. Mm -hmm. And if one maybe doesn't work, the other one does. So I think there's an opportunity for that one as well. Um, I also think that uh, by having Explore Edmonton do it tied to the sales teams, we can drive other revenues. Uh, like for example, Mayor, you're aware that we now work with the 
uh, AGA and we deliver their food services. Mm -hmm. That does provide additional revenue and it also improves the visitor experience for a premier venue that we have. So um, I can't commit to it being cost neutral. I don't know of another venue in Canada okay. that is cost neutral. Okay, I think that's a good information to have. Like if you, you're, you're trying, right, but uh, we also need to recognize that you, we may not get there because of uh, the nature of the business, right? So uh, uh, I also, I think I'm coming to this realization that the because you have taken on additional responsibilities, your base budget of $11.7 million needs to be adjusted on a permanent basis moving forward so you can fulfill all those responsibilities. Do a good job of marketing, Edmonton, and other responsibilities that you have. Am I correct in that assessment? That's what you want to do, and uh, this motion allows you I would give you certainty for one year, which we did last year as well, right? But I think what, you, what I understand you're looking for is permanent increases to the base funding that you don't have to deal with this un, in this uncertainty ongoing. That's correct. Okay, I think that's what we would have to grapple this year. Because um, uncertainty is not healthy. No, and I just want to reaffirm our commitment uh, to working with you and administration. I think that this temporary relief allows us to then spend the time to really review each of those three areas of our mandate mm -hmm. um, and work together to understand the value and then commit where we want to be going forward more in a, in a more predictable way. Mm -hmm. So... I understand questions around, you know, dealing with $3 million now, then having further discussion in, uh, in April, but that also doesn't deal with the uncertainty you have, right? I think having <clears throat> given you one time funding of $6 million gives you and council and administration time to figure out the long-term sustainable funding. That's correct. Okay. Got it. Uh, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate this. Uh, with that, uh, I will take the chair back. And this concludes the questions. We have a motion on the floor now to speak to the motion. Councillor Stevenson to speak. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, really appreciate the conversation this morning. You know, I... I believe very strongly in public investment and public amenities. Uh, the return on investment is very direct and concrete. Uh, when we build a facility, uh, members of the public have access to that. When we provide programs, members of the public have access to that. So for me, that's that's a very clear um, reason or, or a way to invest our public dollars. When we look at less tangible investments of public dollars, I think we require a very different kind of scrutiny and value for dollar analysis. Um, when one of the first things I look for in that is the kind of direct return on investment. And as we heard today, again, recognizing there's many, many different factors, and this is just a small snapshot of, of the financial implications of our, our visitor economy. Uh, we, we heard the important role that hotels play in the commercial tax base and how significantly they've been affected in recent years. And so while as a city, we may still collect our full tax revenue. Uh, we saw that, you know, last year it was about a $6 million um, uh, transfer of, of tax burden onto other uh, businesses. You know, the other question I think is so important to ask is how our public investment is leveraging other funding sources. Um, I am very impressed that only 20% of Explore Edmonton's budget comes from our own contributions and that the rest are able to leverage from other orders of government and private sector. For me, that's a, a very good return on, on dollar. Uh, you know, another unique consideration in this case as well is the liabilities that we would face as a city without a viable Explore Edmonton. As owners of the Convention Centre and Expo land, we have a direct financial interest in the health of the visitor economy. 
these venues are empty, we pay more. Taxpayers pay more. Uh, we've also invested significantly in these venues. As we heard, over 114 million Expo Center alone. So ensuring these venues are viable is another important way to protect our capital investments. So none of this is to say that there aren't financial implications for making this $6 million investment. Uh, again, I see the, the channels of return on that. Um, when I, you know, when we considered this at our, our fall SOBA last year, um, the $6 million felt very, very daunting and I was comfortable waiting until the spring when we had a clearer picture of our 2023 financials and the work of OP12. Uh, since we now have some of that preliminary information around OP12 and the opportunities that exist, I feel more confident in our ability to redirect the necessary funds to support this while still meeting many of our other priorities. So given the urgency of this funding request, I'm comfortable moving forward with it, forward with it today and appreciate uh, the mover again for, for bringing it at this time. I'm also looking forward to the conversation brought forward by Councillor Cartmel's motion in terms of alternative uses for the f facilities and our um, ongoing conversations about right sizing and focusing explore Edmonton's mandate. So thank you again to the mover and I look forward to supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Tang. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you for the conversation today. Uh, I think, you know, really support what Councillor Stevenson has said. Uh, you know, I know this conversation has been ongoing for for many months, and there has been a lot of um, worries that perhaps um, this council isn't valuing tourism sector um, as much. But I think this is a reflection of, you know, I think. Uh, Mr. Corbell mentioned earlier, lots of juggling priorities and also the unsustainable nature of annual uh, SOBA, you know, false uh, supplemental budget adjustment funding requests. Um, you know, one of the things I've, uh, themes that I've noticed that is that, of, you know, typically when, in, you know, in times of um, constraints, it's not just about matter of accommodating more requests. And this is true for many things that we have seen across this table, but really pushing for the conversation about strategic direction and mandate. And so I'm glad to see um, that is the direction that is gonna be taking place um, moving forward. And uh, and I really appreciate a lot of those questions in that, in, in that direction from my colleagues. I know that um, the sector isn't just and it, uh, isn't just coming back from COVID, uh, but for the for Explore organization itself, you know, a lot of it is also still trying to recover from the major transitions um, since you know the uh, the EDC structure at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, while you know, in some ways, I. Uh, I resonate with what Councillor Rutherford was saying in terms of perhaps this is sidelining a bit of a due process that we've already gone through. Um, but I think, you know, the timing is pretty critical right now. And um, at least I see, you know, as part of the funding, there is that more of that strategic and, and mandate conversation to uh, move towards uh, that predictable funding model. Um, and I hope, you know, the guests today and the community, um, again, sees the, you know, the, the commitment um, from me and the call, my colleagues around, like, when it comes to tourism and when it comes to this really critical, um, you know, economic boosting mechanism that we, that we have. Um, so thank you for, uh, to the mover for making this timely motion. Um, and I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mayor. At the beginning, I I think this decision is, uh, uh, is not very clear for me and to which way we should move forward. And because there are many, many questions and still not fully um, um, answered and based on the information will come back to April. Uh, but I do heard very clearly um, there are two points here. Uh, the first point is about the um, for, from long-term perspective for this organization's contribution to our city's economy. Uh, 
recovery and growth and that stability and the timeline, the timing, and how we can make sure the, the base operational funding be provided really can plan in advance for the programming uh, that could attract more uh, investment or more uh, return and back to our city. So I heard that clear. And also I heard about the cre uh, priority. I know, I know right now our city and we do have some financial challenge. So we really want to make sure our money used uh, every single dollars be used will bring value back to our Edmontonians. Uh, I also, I heard about, uh, we have so many, so many uh, competing priorities, but how we balance those priorities with the limited resources, including the funding. So I think that strategically decision um, making uh, is really, really critical. And for our financial, for our city's financial situation at the same time, for our city's economic situation as well. Um, so I I know and is there more information will come in April uh, for the long-term uh, funding model and how we can um, support, uh, financially support uh, Explore Edmonton and also like other type of um, agencies, our city um, to move forward. Um, I'm a little bit struggling to support this. Uh, however, I heard, uh, Mayor mentioned about the stable, if it's not stable, it's not healthy. And also I heard about um, if we cannot invest right now, it seems we'll delay some return or even deny some like further uh, planning and investment to the city. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I will support this right now, but I really looking forward the more information, more data come back. Uh, to in front of us for decision making in, ter in terms of financial supporting, uh, what's return, what's investment, and also how that align with our city's core services priorities. So I'm really looking forward to that type of information and come back for the next uh, report and really align our city's limited financial funding and resources uh, with our city's co services. So I'm looking forward for that type of information and come back and to make sure our Edmontonians understand that every dollar we spend here, every dollar we invested will have a return, will have value, bring back and to increase our city's economy and to support the better quality of an Edmontonian's life. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Can you take the chair, please? Yeah, chair is taken. Thank you. I want to thank Councilor Salvador for uh, bringing this uh, forward. And if this approve, is approved, then um, at least give some certainty to explore Edmonton until the end of 2024 and gives us time to sit down with them and uh, dig deeper into uh, how we can increase the base level funding, which is, in my mind, is very, very important things to settle because without that, uh, Explored Edmonton would not get the certainty that it needs to uh, continue to attract tourism, continue to attract conventions, and also it does cause uncertainty around the running of those two important uh, venues as well. Explored Edmonton is absolutely, plays a critical role in uh, supporting our economic growth and prosperity in the city. And I think this council has demonstrated that commitment uh, uh, by providing sustainable funding to other organizations such as uh, Edmonton Global, uh, such as uh, uh, Edmonton Unlimited. And we have also demonstrated our commitment to economic growth by removing red tape uh, and also uh, you know, removing, uh, you know, overhauling zoning regulations that allows uh, uh, Edmontonians and others to do business in the city in a, uh, in a, in a, in an easy way, as well as the creation of the business friendly Edmonton that allows that services that people need uh, to access. So I think 
that it, and exploded Menton is integral to that ecosystem and it needs sustainable funding and predictable funding. I don't know what that funding will look like, but I think that's a conversation we need to, uh, need to have. Uh, I, you know, we heard from administration, we heard from the, the hotel industry that, uh, you know, they are on the path to recovery. And I think giving predictability to explore Edmonton will help that with, with that, uh, that recovery. And I also heard from um, people who run uh, uh, restaurants, bars, and pubs, and they, they're on the path to recovery as well. So they rely on tourism, they rely on conventions. I think we need to see it in a, in a, in a big picture, picture as well, right? And uh, uh, so I look forward to those conversations once uh, this, uh, this funding is, is approved, if it is approved by, by council. Uh, but I also you know, wanted, I don't know how to grapple this, uh, what the solutions are, but I also see decisions being made by us and previous council where when the responsibilities are transferred, corresponding funding doesn't follow at the same time, and we have to struggle later on. We allocated one-time funding, which is fine. I see with the on-demand bus services is a reminder of that too, right? I think we need to figure out a way that uh, once we know that demand is permanent, that demand is ongoing, we need to figure out to provide more sustainable, predictable funding to, uh, in this case, uh, we know that for our economic success, our tourism success, for our convention success, explore Edmonton needs ongoing, sustainable, predictable funding. So I look forward to that conversation when we get to uh, get to get to that point. Uh, uh, with that, I will take the chair back and go to Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you, um, Mayor Sohi. Um, I wasn't going to speak to this. I, I am going to support the motion, but I do feel it's it's important to speak to this because again. I, I really just, I've been reiterating this multiple times since uh, being elected, is that when we make these decisions on a one-by-one -one basis, by the time we get to budget, we're so backed into corners um, and we're having less and less to even pull, pull from. Pulling this from the financial stabilization reserve is not ideal when we could have just increased the tax levy and given them that sustainable funding at the fall SOBA. And I know we were, you know, trying to get that low, but if this is something that was really important to us as a council, that would have been the best process and the best time to have that. I've been very clear, it was in my campaign platform and to this day that that tourism and our, our um, entertainment industries are huge, huge economic drivers and we need to support them. So in terms of supporting this, the you know, just to, to explore Edmonton, you've always had my support on this. I just do not like the process that we as a council are going through right now. I think we we have these supplemental budget adjustments to grapple with all of the competing priorities. And even, you know, as Mr. Corbold mentioned, the other report today that talks about the housing and houselessness uh, immediate actions and uh, the the amount of dollar signs I see with that. Um, I'm very concerned about using the financial stabilization reserve for this funding source. It does not provide the stability. It's it's going to push us in fall SOBA to have to uh, either really look at um, increasing the tax levy for Explore Edmonton, or we've just increased their budget, um, and we're 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 stringing them along in a way that I don't think is fair either. That being said, I also really want to encourage Explore Edmonton. I know that there's a lot that you've taken on in an increased mandate, but you know we as a city are going through the OP12 um, activities uh, to look for any and every opportunity to streamline costs, to reduce costs, to say what is needed and what is not needed. Um, and and we've asked and called upon all of our external agencies to do the same. And I, I still think there is opportunity and room there for Explore to do the great work that they do and that they we need them to do in the city in a more financially minded manner. So I, I think that we need to have both conversations. So I am willing to support this. 
but I am very concerned about process. Um, and, and I hope that, you know, when we're coming up to supplemental budget discussions as, as council, that we understand that what we prioritize at those should be our priorities for the year. Um, and we should be able to hold and be accountable to those decisions one way or the other and the impacts of those decisions. Um, so, so let's try to clean up our process going forward, but I will support this because I support Explore. I think it's important. We don't want to lose this economy. It hasn't fully recovered like other Canadian municipalities have and, and we need it to recover. So, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Salvador to close. Yeah, thank you so much um, and really appreciate the conversation today and, um, and the excellent mm -hmm. questions and answers that we received. Um, and yeah, I, I don't have too much to add, uh, but I will say that we, we all know that the economic activity and growth that Explore generates far outweighs its annual costs. Um, what really stands out to me is hearing about um, how much Explore is able to leverage from various partners and private corporate investors. It's so impressive and I wouldn't want to lose that. Uh, we know that the return on investment is incredibly strong. Um, this motion really provides an opportunity uh, for Explore to tread water and avoid eliminating programming in the immediate term, uh, while still providing that opportunity to have uh, those larger strategic conversations about mandate, programming, and base funding going forward. Um, and, and as was mentioned, collectively, this is still less than what they need. Uh, it's temporary stabilization, but uh, the $6 million will at least allow for base operations to continue uh, and importantly allows for time uh, to have that longer term conversation about aligning programming and mandate with funding in a more permanent way uh, to provide that stability. Uh, and when I think about the, the funds that we invest in to explore, uh, and, and the dividends that they pay in a variety of ways. I need to continue supporting that. Um, I think about local businesses, hotels, restaurants, retailers, um, and importantly, Edmontonians who depend on and rely on our continued investment and participation in uh, city events and activities, including things like festivals, uh, as well as conferences, um, and many of the other activities that are brought here by, by Explore Edmonton. Uh, without any additional certainty in the interim, we've heard directly from Explore uh, that they would need to be looking at cancelling programs, uh, removing themselves from bids and sales processes, uh, which could permanently have uh, an impact on our economy. I don't want to see that, uh, which is why I'm putting this forward today and um, appreciate that uh, it might not be the ideal process, um, but uh, I do think it's the best path forward at this time. Uh, so I hope the Council can support this today, and I look forward to future conversations about aligning funding with mandate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. All right, so please vote. Yeah. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, that is carried. All right, now we are going to go to... So thank you so much for the delegation for joining us from Explorer Edmonton. Uh, we are, have concluded this item. And motion has carried. If if you were not able to uh, able to see it, uh, all right. Now we are heading to our next item, which is three point three actions to respond to housing and houselessness emergency. And we'll go to administration for a presentation. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, Good morning. I'm joined by our city's chief of staff, Salima Ibrahim, and the mayor's chief of staff, Lisa Holmes, I believe is online, to speak to the actions to respond to the housing and houselessness emergency. At the January 15th, 2024 special city council meeting, council passed a motion to declare a housing and houselessness emergency. As an immediate step, the mayor invited the government of Canada, the government of Alberta, and the Confederacy of Treaty 6 First Nations to discuss collaborative solutions to the emergency. 
Accompanying the declaration, Council provided direction for administration to advance two key pieces of work. The first was a list of immediate actions that the City could take to address the crisis. And the second, a task force led by my office and the Mayor, with one Council representative with a mandate to mobilize all sectors, expedite red tape reduction related to housing and houselessness. And $3.5 million is now allocated to act as seed money for the task force's work to fund innovative solutions and attract additional sources of funding. To create the terms of reference and help determine the task force membership, administration is seeking council's decision on its representative to the task force. And to support that decision, the report uh, recommendation provides a fill in the blank motion for council to consider. Now, not including the request to nominate council's representative to the task force, administration did prepare a list of 48 ideas that the city can consider to accelerate our efforts to address the housing and houselessness emergency. I would not say this 48 ideas is exhaustive. It's what we have come up with in the last two and a half weeks uh, with other events going on. So we'll keep on uh, considering other ideas. When we consider all of uh, the municipal levels financial, sorry, when we consider all of our municipal levers, financial, policy, regulatory, and advocacy, the items have been sorted into several themes, including identifying additional funding, direct investments, streamlined and expedited processes to reduce delivery timelines, supports for individuals experiencing houselessness, supports for individuals at risk of houselessness, and working with partners including other orders of government. A selection of these ideas are shown on the slide in front of you with a comprehensive lift list of the 48 ideas provided in attachment one to the report. There are items that we can look at within our existing programs, for instance, streamlined development permits and fee structures, but there are also items that would require council approval. If you do express interest in the ideas, we can certainly return quickly back to council with, de with decisions where you can provide your authorization to move forward. We do know that the City of Edmonton's power lies in its ability to convene willing and ready partners to support their fellow community members. Both the Mayor and I will continue to use all of our advocacy channels to broker whatever solutions we can find. And we look forward to hearing your reaction to the items we identified, recognizing that you have several critical reports to discuss this meeting. Um, whatever decisions you can provide would be great, but we can also bring this back at any time. But I would uh, fundamentally request your feedback to confirm the work we are contemplating is moving us at least forward in the right desired path. And I think having uh, a council rep appointed today would be really helpful to getting the task force going as well. So thank you for your time and we're happy to take questions. Okay, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, in order to appoint a council rep, I just want to understand the process from uh, uh, clerk. Uh, one council member has shown interest, right? So I haven't heard other interests, right? But there was some, I, I think uh, there's uh, people been back and forth, right? So uh, I don't think we need to, I have not, if there's consensus around one person, right? And is anyone else, I don't know if they wanna step up. So for that, we need to go into camera, right? If there's more than one. Right? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if somebody wants to put their name forward, then we can do that. So, but at this time, Councillor Stevenson, can you go ahead, please? Yes, move thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to move that uh, Councillor Aaron Rutherford be appointed as Council's representative on the Housing and Houselessness Task Force for a term ending October 19th, 2025, as described in Attachment 1 of the January 30th, 2024 Office of the City Manager Report, OCM 02332. Okay, I'll second that. Uh, all right, so we have motion on the floor. Now we open, up, uh, open to questions on the motion and, and the report. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, go ahead. Great, thank you so much. I I was incredibly impressed reading through this report. Uh, you know, I already feel like we are doing a lot to support housing and homelessness, but this report really flagged all the additional areas where we can continue to push and, and accelerate work. So I, I'm mindful of time. I'm also mindful that I can't spend all my time talking about the things I think are really positive um, and, and very encouraged by, so I'm just gonna focus on a few that I had questions for. Um, under the um, freeing up funding, uh, we speak about the land enterprise dividend. Did we give any consideration uh, for making dedications for growth in the EPCOR dividend or potentially the Edtel Investment Fund? 
I think those are both, could, we could do that. I, I think uh, we've considered that before, Councillor, as you know, with the climate uh, options, we've, we've put that forward as a climate initiative as well. So I, I think currently the city has two emergencies that Council has declared. One is for climate and one is for housing. So uh, certainly um, specific dividends could be used to support either or. Um, and so really the will of council, but those are easy to do. They're, they're one of the easiest things to activate very quickly if council Great. makes a decision about what they want to do with future dividends. Great, so we'd get some options back for all of those uh, potential sources. So uh, Land Enterprise, EPCOR and EDTEL? Yeah. Great. Correct. And I think the question is simple. Do you want to commit now all, pre, all future increases to these two emergencies and, and in what Mm -hmm. Is it a 50-50 or is it one, does one prior to the other? And then we can do that in the future when we get those dividend numbers. Yeah, and I think I think for me looking at developing a, a policy so that it would be sort of a lasting approach. And I'd be looking for advice just in terms of what, what administration recommends in terms of that division and what the implications are as well. Again, we may, if we're, you know, what, what do those dividends typically go to? What, what may we have to compensate in other ways? I think some of that analysis would be helpful. Yeah, and I, we can provide that. I, and uh, maybe if I can, the simple answer to that is they typically go to whatever is on top of council's mind yeah. at the moment we get the dividend check. Yeah. And this is why we have recommended before that you know it would be better to make a more deliberate decision of future dividend increases, so you're not sort of faced uh, with whatever the crisis of the of the week is, because there's going to be one every week, right? Absolutely. So we 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 like the idea of pre dedicating it and given that we now have two emergencies that makes sense to me to prioritize over all the other priorities we have absolutely and I think having a, a policy so that that is in place in perpetuity would be would be really positive uh, just with the question of relooking at recent budgetary decisions uh, are we thinking both capital and operating so that was number five under free up funding yeah, I, I think uh, absolutely we could consider both. Um, I think I would say though that we did look hard at the capital and there's not a lot to stop with, and, and this goes back to some of the assessments we provided council about a year and a, year and a bit ago where there's not a lot of opportunities to, mm -hmm. to slow down or stop capital funding. So I, I think it could be open in small amounts, but um, it's gonna be very difficult. And I think the other issue is um, if we're giving funding to others, that becomes an operational expense, not a capital one, um, especially if we're supporting you know, either private or not-for-profit housing initiatives. Yeah, I mean, I think with capital, we, again, we, there could be a physical asset if we're actually building buildings. Um, but one, one thing I wanted to caution against was, uh, or, or maybe suggest when we're looking at some of those decisions, because we have made some fairly significant decisions around uh, transit in particular um, and active transportation. So just wanting to ensure that we are considering the holistic notion of affordability that's in our city plan in terms of the cost of housing and transportation. So potentially not revisiting decisions that help lower the cost of, of transportation. Yeah, I, I would agree. In fact, we, we considered adding some transit um, mm. things, but then quite frankly, that worked counter to the climate emergency. So we didn't, we didn't keep them on the list. Like investment in transit has been supportive of um, the work we're doing from a climate action perspective. And so we felt to put that, something like that, take money out of transit would be actually counter to supporting the climate emergency. And so we didn't right. really feel that was a good idea. Yeah, and I think equally uh, counter to, to supporting the housing housing crisis as well. Agreed. Great. Yeah. I will try to minimize my, my rounds, but I'll have to come back. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really, really excellent report. Um, excellent list of ideas. I guess just a uh, very first question. Um, you know, how, just to, to the city manager, are you essentially just looking to hear from us around um, feedback, potential areas of interest? What is your preferred process to, to advance beyond this stage? Just need to make sure I'm crystal clear. Yeah, I think so you're looking for options, right? Yeah, the, I mean, I think you know, like I said, we're not. We, despite the emergency, we put our best effort forward in this pretty short time to come up with each idea. We're still coming up with other ideas. I think for today is just getting. A, I, I think it's almost more important to know if there's any areas here you don't want us to go down. Uh, because that would be helpful and we could we could not work on those. I think it would be really great to get a councillor rep 
because I think the getting that task force activated would be uh, essential as an emergency uh, item and and uh, yeah just getting general uh, support for these ideas and then we can bring them back they're all going to come back on different timelines based on the complexity of each of them but in particular you know doing does council want to get do actually some direct funding for the indigenous visiting business case for example would be good to know yeah that's that's super helpful thank you for that um and that's actually right where i was going to go is just some of those opportunities for direct investments um i had the indigenous housing business case on my list um and wondering yeah how we might um dive into that further and and accelerate that i i don't quite know the exact status of um uh, our partners, the federal government, but um, interested in advancing that sooner rather than later. Uh, yeah. Maybe post as a question. Yeah, well, I would say, Councillor, that the next opportunity to, if, if that is an avenue Council wants to go down, the next opportunity to consider that is when we discuss the OP12 report next week, because we've given you options now for the for for where the money could come from. If Council wants to support some direct investments, not not in the whole thing necessarily, but the first couple of places, then that could come out of the OP12 discussion, then we'd be off to the races on that. Great, great. Uh, well, looking forward to that. Um, also in the realm of direct investments um, and looking at providing city land for, for free or nominal costs, um, just thinking, you know, top of mind, uh, things like bridge healing, where it's small sites, uh, kind of a proven model that can be replicable um, with Jasper Place Wellness Center and, and other partners. Um, opportunities there to, to accelerate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we would welcome that. And we do understand that uh, they might be ready to do some more expansion. So uh, we actually, I sent a note to them over the weekend about that and uh, ready to have that discussion with them. We, we know, for example, the first one that we invested in is very successful and was, was is making differences. So I, I think that's a good example of an investment. I think it's also one, it's a good example where, you know, with council support, we could provide the land without necessarily having to provide, you know, the full cost for, for, for things like that. So that's a really important place where we can play um, mm -hmm. to, you know, for little cost to Edmontonians in, per, in terms of providing land. So. Okay. Amazing. I'm happy to hear that you're, you're already in contact with those folks um, and, and great to see, you know, the initial investment being able to leverage additional dollars and, and then a successful model. So that's good. Um, also wanted to ask about, uh, we received a letter from HOMED um, just outlining an opportunity to to expand and scale up uh, their role in providing um, non-market public housing. What, did, did administration receive that as well? Yeah, we did receive it. And in fact, um, if I had received it before we published the report, I may have added the list of the idea to the to the report. Uh, so we really appreciate the idea, and um, uh, I did get a copy of it, and I and I think it's worthy of of considering. I also think that our report actually has some of those ideas embedded within it. So it's just a matter of uh, if we want to attach some of those ideas to HOMED being the solution. I think that is very worthy of consideration. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. We've received it, and we'll, we'll add it to the list. It was just that we received the letter after the report was published. So. Okay. Okay. And um, I mean, that's something that I'm really interested in exploring, um, and and pursuing. So at this point, uh, you're able to advance those conversations without emotion. Is that? Yeah. Fair? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We're. Okay. I, uh, we'll speak with them for sure. And uh, I think there was also some idea on. Uh, they also may be one of uh, the potential candidates to be on the task force from from outside the city, which I think would oh, make sense too. Great. Um, I'll come back for another round. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So with HOMED's idea, looking at the the seed capital, that's that's not at all in any way acting as a lender for affordable housing development that you've got listed as, as one of your options under reducing red tape. That's just providing them the money. It's not, we're not acting as their, as a lender for them. Yeah, right? I see it. Yeah. Like, I see okay. it as different counselor. Yeah. You'd ask what, yeah. what things um, would be like an absolute no. To me, that would be one. Okay. That's helpful. That's a no. Yeah, um, yeah. There's lending institutions out there that can <laughs> do that and take, take that risk. Um, I'm just also wondering about, uh, where is it? Under, no. 
Oh, insofar as um, the, the reference to the, the province's navigation center. Um, like some of us had the opportunity to, to tour that last week. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, don't, don't some of these social agencies already have this information and this approach um, in house? And, I, and I'm thinking about the, you know, the, the connections for the ID. They can't actually print the ID on site, but I know Boyle Street in that. The I same think that'll be a good question for when we go into our encampment report, because there'll be delegation from uh, some folks from the police as well, what is happening at the, uh, at the navigation center. So probably that be, might be, I know Andre, uh, that might be a good opportunity to ask those questions there. But, I, but I think it does sort of relate, because this well, they're, they're doing relate. Being I, done, they're doing, right? And yeah. I, in that same time period, um, I've heard from Boyle Street, or um, that they processed 243 applications for ID in that same time period and the, the province actually issued 40. So if, if they could have that ability on site to actually issue the ID as well, um, yeah, they might. Yeah, I would agree, Councillor, uh, uh, absolutely. And I think Boyle and the province can talk about that because they're mostly funded through the province anyways. So those are absolutely good conversations for them to have, yeah. And, th and then because um, I think in the report it talks about your continued work with the social agencies and I'm just wondering and to partner with them so what have we heard so far since this um, emergency was since we declared the emergency or the on, on the homeless emergency yeah. and ideas specifically on that um, I I don't I'm not aware but I can maybe I don't know if uh, Salima or somebody else has an answer to that I mean it's been pretty short timeline yeah. so uh, we've been we've been having a lot more conversations with them about the encampment work, but yeah. Okay, but but I'm talking yeah housing like how yeah how are they able to direct people to housing? Have what sort of success have they had? What are the barriers and challenges that um, that they've experienced? Yeah, I, I just I it just because yeah it says administration continues to partner, so I'm just wondering what we've heard. Yeah, since this was declared. Yeah, and I would assume that we would have some of them um, appointed to the task force as well. So another reason that it'd be nice to get the task force going. So okay. If uh, if you want me to, I can speak to what we have heard, Councillor. Right. Is that within procedure? <laughs> or is that? If you ask the question to them, uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, my team has been holding uh, preliminary meetings with a number of uh, stakeholders with expertise in, uh, uh, in social innovation, facilitation, as well as affordable housing providers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so what we're hearing is look at some of the innovative ways to uh, structure that are already there uh, for solutions focused on uh, engagement. And do, well, we all, one another thing we're hearing that do not follow the traditional kind of task force structure of simply conducting research and producing a report, not taking an action. I think there's already a lot of research uh, out there and some of the guiding principles that uh, people would like to follow. So there's a lot going on in internally, so we will be able to probably share more once we have uh, the, the task force uh, established. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm glad that Councillor Rutherford has the time to take on um, <laughs> this appointment. I, I had considered it myself, but with the recent appointment to the Police Commission, yeah, no time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Councillor Tang. Oh, great. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, uh, very much support, Councillor Rutherford, for this task force. Um, I am finding that um, the task force conversation and the report in front of us are being conflated a little bit together, so I wanted to separate them out a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm noting, you know, um, you know, lots of great work in such a short, uh, short turnaround time. Um, did you kind of think about some other framework for thinking about housing intervention? I'm noting a lot of the actions are really organized around tasks. Um, because, you know, we've also talked a lot about making sure people are on the same page when we say, uh, you know, what does crisis intervention look like? What does uh, prevention of re-entry into homelessness look like, et cetera? Just wondering if you kind of looked at some of those other frameworks. I, I think, Kalter, we, we have thought about it for a few minutes in in the convenient weeks we've had since then. I, I think it's something that uh, we have to do more of, so, yeah. 
Yeah, so I will encourage that and also maybe taking a look at some of the other work. Um, you know, I'll reference Australia has some really great work around the future of home, for example, that actually speaks a lot to some of the work we've already done as well. Um, the kind of, again, you know, centering on people with lived experience and their stories and, and what work, work for them. Um, I'm, I'm also, you know, one, you know, I'm also noting a lot of the ideas are um, very much around physical, you know, their system infrastructure re um, related, but not not necessarily um, integrated with pieces around social infrastructure, things like rethinking roles, spaces, interactions, you know, very much the levers uh, embedded within the city's own well-being framework. Um, you know, moving forward, will you consider some of that integration of those pieces? Yeah, I think we have to counter. I think one of the um, biggest challenges is is coordination with everybody that's out in the space and integrating it in a better way. Uh, and that's a consistent challenge we've seen in the space. So if we can do that, that requires the support of the agencies themselves as well as other orders of government. But yeah, that would be very helpful and I think it's something that we should pursue. I, I think um, that also came out in the Provincial Homelessness Task Force report, the, the, the coordination challenges. So I think I, we just haven't found the best solution yet to it as far as I can tell. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm speaking more um, less about systems coordination, but more around engaging folks who will ultimately benefit from, you know, various interventions and services and rethinking about how perhaps they might be involved uh, in some of these decision-making. And I think that will be a theme I'll continue to raise um, as we continue with the housing conversation. Um, and then I'm, I'm pleased to see uh, things like SOLAS, for example, is included as the list of ideas. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, next steps? This is something, um, you know, we've heard quite a bit from those directly involved at committee. I cannot, but I'll see if anybody else, if not, we can sort of get back to you on that one. I, yeah, I know we, I would. we kind of wanted to do that, but we I don't think we've figured out exactly what the spe specific next step on that one is. Okay, yeah, no problem. Happy to kind of get a follow up on that. And I guess just a question around the task force, which I see it as separate from the administration report itself. Uh, you know, typically function or typically form follows function. Um, but I'm already hearing around, you know, who might be on this task force and what they might do. Um, I guess, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm also hearing this conversation about function, uh, you know, with social innovation experts and, and whatnot. Um, because I think if we end up focusing just around like who is represented and what are the external stakeholders we need to have, that feels pretty traditional to me. Um, so I guess I'm just, you know, I just want to stress that point and want to hear any, I guess, reaction to that. I, I think my reaction is countered. I, I, I would just like some assistance in clearly understanding what a per, perhaps non-traditional um, list of task force members and tasks are, and then we can get to doing that. Yeah, absolutely. But for, you know, just just to use Homet as an example, kind of already hearing that they may there's an interest and, you know, we're gonna try to seek that interest out, but I would just urge um, as, uh, you know, whoever's leading the conversation sure. with various stakeholders, I think, you know, I would I will want to know what the task force will accomplish that's separate, that's different from administration, et cetera, before landing on membership. Okay, that's yeah. all for me. Thank you so yeah, much. No, thank you, Constantine. I think it's a very, very good, good point because, uh, you know, names have been suggested, but uh, I don't think we have, uh, uh, any and landed on any of them, right? And I, I think tapping into non-traditional kind of, particularly people with lived experience and those who work in the social innovation sector, right? So, okay, yeah, now thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you. Um, just wanting to provide a little bit of feedback on the actions for council consideration and attachment one. Um, I, I guess one of the things that I would just give feedback to, and I'd be curious your thoughts on this, Mr. Corbold, is under the section for support, supporting individuals pending a transition away from encampments, it says establish an outreach hub similar to what the province is doing. That's one that I'm, it feels like extreme overlap. We're financially tapped. 
you know, I think if we're addressing the housing and houselessness emergency, we need to do it in a way that uses our strengths, uses the provincial strengths, uses the federal strengths, and uses all of the other sectors' strengths to their best ability. So that was one that I, I, I don't know what your thought was in putting that one in, but that's one that I'm not really super keen on exploring further. Yeah, that that, that one is there because we have seen um, in, in recent weeks uh, with the increased coordination, um, we're getting um, a lot more people access. So I don't think necessarily would have to be funded by Edmonton. To be honest, my, my first uh, approach for that one would be to see if the the province can make a commitment to extend that kind of coordination effort uh, because, because right now it's just temporary right yeah i mean it, we 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 know we're pretty confident it's 30 days minimum we we're confident we can get a few more months but I, I mean i have made overtures with the province you know that could we even go longer there could this be a permanent uh, fixture so uh, you know i am i I think they're going to think about it. So I, that's how I would push that initially, I think. Uh, and I think it's better aligned with their jurisdiction. Okay. And then I'm going to ask a probably unpopular question, but I think it's worth shoring up. Under the free up funding section, um, does this reopen the funding formula debate? Uh, For my, point five. Yeah, my intent was to reopen uh, to to consider this uh, as part of the op12 um, because we we provided options for for reconsider so I had not and in op12 we had not opened up the funding formula so my thinking in adding that was more about using the money that could be freed up as part of the op12 process oh really because the way I read it it's 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 actually like saying okay, because OP12 is is administration saying, okay, with this space budget, this is how we're going to reallocate. If we're talking about council decisions on budget, to me, that's that's distinct. So I'm glad we're I'm, I'm glad I asked this question now. Yeah, and to be fair, I'm like I'm, I've just pulled up the list again. I mean, it's not just OP12. We've also talked about council contingency funding, enterprise land. So so it's probably yeah. No, more. there's other points yeah. in there that I think yeah. are really good, but just yeah. specifically on point five, the, I'm just trying to understand what that's going to open up because reconsider all recent decisions with significant budgetary impacts. I can't think of anything that had more significant operating budget impacts than the funding formula. Yeah. Recent no. decisions. Yeah. No, it's a fair point. And I, I think um, we, we put it there because, you know, the, the emergency in my mind, the declaration of council's emergency change the context of mm -hmm. all dis funding decisions and so that's why I felt mm -hmm. it important to put that there. Yeah, no and I and I I agree. I just I just want counselors to understand to me that that's how I read that 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 would be a potential discussion we're reopening. So if it's not I I just want to know that. Like I want to know if 25 are we or are we or are we not reopening that conversation around funding formula? Is that to council or to me? It, it wasn't to my you, intent. To you. So, so from That's administrative, not your okay. when we wrote that, we did not intend to open that conversation again. So if we did want to open that conversation again, you'd want some direction? Yes. Okay. I'm just going to make sure I get all, I don't, I was, oh, I'm out of time. I will stop here in, in respecting time and uh, potentially come back for another round if, if other questions I have on the list aren't answered. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. Uh, perhaps similarly, I'm wondering about uh, if any consideration was given to accelerating uh, the land enterprise assets and disposal of the land enterprise assets. You know, we had previously uh, discussed, uh, well, speaking and plainly getting out of the land development business and, and disposing of those assets. So is, could that be something that could be reconsidered? I guess that this is similar to Councillor Rutherford, the question of reconsideration of past conversations. So just wondering if that came up. Um, it did, Councillor, and uh, we believe, I think, yes, that we, and, and what I've been asking the staff is what can we accelerate? What could we accelerate? Um, they're always complicated, as you know, but uh, yeah, yeah. We, th we think it's worth considering that. 
Uh, and and I you know I guess just uh, I should have started by saying just building on the idea that we have land but maybe not a lot of money and land might be one of the resources we can use. So you know, prefacing my previous comment, but also wondering if we've made any progress with the public school board about declaring sites that are clearly surplus surplus, and if there's uh, been any further conversation on that score. I wouldn't say we've made any uh, significant progress, but I think uh, we're. I think the next step on that is to get the school board chairs with council together to have, to have some of those conversations, and and I think that is something that could be done for sure. So I've heard this idea that we have to have a meeting with the chairs and council before we can have any conversation around surplus school sites, and. Uh, but I see nothing in our agenda that has any such meeting, and I'm getting really frustrated that we cannot make progress on this. Uh, that's land that's available. Uh, a lot of it is serviced. Uh, a dollar a year lease for 75 years makes that land leverageable to housing partners. And the only thing in between us and getting something done is the reticence of the school board to declare sites that are clearly surplus, surplus. So uh, can we move forward on whatever meeting has to happen so that we can actually have this conversation? Because it's uh, I've got a site in the ward I represent that's going on three years of being emasculated by this uh, inability to have a conversation. Yeah, uh, I don't believe we have to wait for that particular meeting, but it, I, I think it's about how, how can we engage the school board? Absolutely, I, we, I think we need to move forward on that as soon as possible. We've been trying to get that meeting for months so yeah great so, so who's not willing to have the meeting um i don't think I anybody mean, is not willing to have the meeting i think between your agenda and other people's agendas it's just difficult to get these folks together all of you yeah yeah it's too bad they couldn't make it today okay thank you thank you constable card well if, if i can add uh, i did have a conversation very recently with one of the chairs of the school boards and uh, we talked about surplus school sites so this is something that we they want to follow up as well as quick so we need to set up that meeting as quickly as possible thank you for flagging that councillor carmel uh councillor jans yeah, thank you. And just to build on that too, I also just had a, a meeting with the chair of the public school board last week on on this topic. And so they're looking at it, they're working on a policy around um, what they can do with this. So I, I totally uh, agree with Councillor Cartmel, though. I think this is urgent. And I think it's one that uh, potentially, um, if if the mayor could prioritize with with his office and 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 get the get the chairs in the room, even if we have to do it individually, like come with some sort of unilateral agreement with first the public, then the Catholic, then the Francophone. I think a lot of time has been lost trying to get everyone in the room together on the same page on all four of these. And obviously it's complex legislation where there's first right of refusals and all sorts of other stuff. But um, I, I'm not saying this to contradict Council Cartmel. I, I agree and there's urgency here, but just wanted to add that as context. Um, sorry, uh, uh, di digressing. Um, I, I like the report. There's a lot in there. I just, uh, for administration, a couple of things. Um, I would love some sort of a consideration of expanding or uh, crediting or promoting HomeShare. Um, I've worked with Canada HomeShare Network. I've worked with HomeShare for students and um, for post-secondary students and others. And, uh, you know, that frees up extra supply in the housing market very rapidly. There's millions, millions of empty bedrooms um, around Alberta and uh, especially here in the cities. Um uh, I'm interested around the pieces of uh, potentially, they call it, uh, um, uh, I forget how you call it, micro housing or small scale housing, but but more around sort of um, tents. A lot of people sent me those CBC articles from, I think it was Newfoundland or New Brunswick, where they had actually a sanctioned kind of, um, uh, I think that I think the tent brand was called Igloo or something, but like a, a winterized tent set up and they had those sanctioned in different places small scale monitored it's an opportunity um i'd be curious about that um expediting permits for secondary suites and laneway housing really interested in that if there's something we can do that could unlock a lot of basements very quickly um i mentioned home share incentives uh i'm interested as well about um and could administration clarify does cmhc cover up to is it we can get uh What's the down payment required? It's only 5%, right? Like if we're building affordable housing, CMHC covers 95%, is that right? 
Uh, I could just offer Councilor Jans that the, the terms of the loan agreements with CMHC vary from program to program, um, but often they emphasize, um, you know, they don't require a ton of equity up, up front the same way that a commercial mortgage might. Right, because when we were at this uh, Chamber of Commerce event last week, if the chambers, you know, or if, if the city's willing to front the land and those those uh, 12 plexes were 1.8 million, if we're going to say do 100 of them uh, and the city was able to help front the down payment to get these built and moving um, and get the operator going, or if we can get the province or others on board, I mean, it does become much more affordable quite quickly. Are we looking yeah. at options like that to sort of just kind of speed burst, get them built? Uh, with the in specific to Jasper Place Health and Wellness, we're in regular communication with them about how we can help them scale and grow as quickly as possible. I would just there because it's supportive housing. They're probably looking at less of a loan, um, a borrowing piece because um, they just can't afford to service a loan and provide the rents that are affordable to people who are exiting unsheltered homelessness. Yeah. So yeah. that might not be a good fit, but certainly I think that's part of the conversation behind the borrowing for affordable housing, and that's you know a similar down approach that like a home ed is taking, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm quite scared. I saw on CBC today that we have the lowest rental vacancy rates in a decade. And to me, that is a giant alarm bell because we know higher rents mean more tense. And, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of folks on the edge who are going to get bumped out. Could could administration remind me how what's what's the breakdown again of how many people can afford less than five hundred dollars, less than a thousand dollars, less than two thousand dollars? Uh, sure. So this data is all available in our uh, 2023 housing needs assessment, but there's approximately 38,000 households in Edmonton that can afford to pay up to $500 per month maximum. And then beyond that, there's another 30,000 households that can afford to pay up to about $1,100 uh, per month maximum. And then beyond that, there's a close to another 6,000 households, mostly large households who require three plus bedrooms that can only afford to pay up to $1,724 or so. Yeah. And had administration contemplated using the funds in the Etel endowment at all or using some of our other reserve funds before, like if we've looked at something like enterprise lands, have we looked at some of our other investment assets? Um, yeah, Councillor, we have considered that. We, we do not, we strongly do not re recommend any use of the principal in any of those funds uh, because you know, I strongly feel that that that's that's we're saving that up for our, for our grandkids and our great grandkids, and I think that's the responsible thing to do. So, you know, and policy would not have us look at those. So we we would strongly um, recommend against going into the principal any of those. We how you want to use the dividends, absolutely uh, will of council, but we would strongly recommend about against going into those um, pieces. Thank you. Okay. Great Dan. report. Thank you, uh, Councillor Neck. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, so, just on the the, the school or piece, and I'm uh, you know because there was a separate meeting that I think we've been trying to schedule for close to a year with all of council and all of the school board um, about joint use and, and a variety of topics. But I'm thinking you know with the urgency of this, this might be something that the task force that you have like to meet with the chair and and like you know just go book one right away, and then we can still try to finalize a, a group meeting at a later time just so that you know as much as I'd like to be in that meeting I, I would trust you I trust Councillor Rutherford to go and do that work and and move that forward so just uh, offering that as a thought um, just since you were asking for feedback Mr. Corwell just if you know a few things and, and appreciate we'll have the discussion next week um, I, I'm actually a little uh, hesitant to use OP12 reallocations for this because uh, I think we've got a lot of other core services that also need funding whether that be snow removal, grass cutting, transit safety, bylaw officers, peace officers. We've, we've heard of about a lot of core things that, that we should fund. And so I'd rather use funding from other sources, but but I might be the only one and we'll have that conversation next week. So we'll, we'll leave that there. Yeah, I guess, I guess my only concern, Councillor, is in, in the hierarchy of priorities, as I see it right now, based on my understanding of the debate that happened, yeah. I see at the very high top end I see a climate emergency and a housing emergency that yeah. council has declared so those will always be things Absolutely. that I think have to be prioritized next we have council's six priorities and then we have core services that like that's yeah. what I'm and this often comes up in our OP12 discussions and there's a lot of non-core stuff we're still doing that council is still making decisions to yeah. fund so yeah. it is the, appreciate the, why you would the recommend level it. of of priorities is 
difficult to grasp. Absolutely, with. yeah. I, I, just for me, I, I would rather look at some of those other funding for sources, whether that be land enterprise, and, and again, I don't want. I think Councillor Cartmel is sort of touching on it, but you know, I, if we're looking to do a relatively large amount in a short amount of relatively short amount of time, you know, do do we need to have a conversation about the land enterprise inventory that we have? And and uh, but but I, but I also appreciate uh, and that I was on the losing side of that, and so I, I wouldn't want to revisit that conversation other than. If we're looking for tens of millions of dollars over the course of, I think, about a two-year period, that is that is something we could do to provide a lot of capital funding to build product. Yeah, absolutely. We, we would we would just need a motion yeah, to change the policy. And, and I couldn't yeah. make that because I was on, on the not the prevailing side. So I'll, I'll I'll leave it there. But I just I wanted to know if that had been talked about. So uh, okay, those were really all my feedback for now. So uh, I'll I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mayor Sahi. Thank you. Uh, just want to focus on the uh, on the opportunity for land allocation, Andre. Uh, we had a presentation at the uh, uh, emergency housing symposium that was organized by uh, Chamber of Commerce, and Crystal did a phenomenal job making cities uh, talking about cities investments. So thank you, Crystal. Uh, the immediate kind of quicker opportunity. So do we have kind of compiled a list of all the lands that we have available that we can start immediate conversation either with the Jasper Pace Wellness or other housing providers? Yeah. Yes, Mayor, we've done that, I'd say, 30 times in okay. the last three years. Yeah. And uh, we most recently did it with uh, with helping uh, the province to look for more shelter space. Correct. So our, um, our real estate folks have great visibility in all the land that, that we have yeah. and where it is and what the different conditions on it and which need rezoning and which don't and all those kinds of things. So 100% yeah. we are ready to talk to anybody who is, is looking for land for, for any of these things. And of course yeah. there's different policies with respect to all that. And, Got and it. absolutely Even, is the answer. So I think getting, getting the word out, reaching out to agencies yeah. and all that, right, is important because that's something that we can do a, immediately there will be, I mean, takes time to build, right? But yeah. something that uh, and I would we can initiate, uh, start right away. And the other thing I would add is some of the challenges in the past are, are that context has changed because as you can imagine, some of the challenges has been amenities and, and, and proximity, but with the opening of the Valley Line and, and other transit initiatives council has mm. invested in, that, that in some ways reduces challenges for places that had previously been looked at that mm -hmm. we can maybe look at in a different way now. Yeah, good, okay. So on going through the list, there's, I, I'm pretty much agreement in uh, all of them supporting and learning more and exploring exploring more, but I do want to flag uh, uh, reconsidering all the recent decisions with significant budgetary impacts because uh, you know, as Councillor, uh, uh, sorry, NAC has identified, there are other decisions that we have made, right, that are important for community, community building, right, and uh, and they also help with the dealing with the, some of the social determinants of health, right, such as rec centers, libraries, and all that, right. So I think uh, because this is a long term, the, this emergency is caused by long term underinvestments in the social infrastructure, right. So we just need to make sure that we continue to build that social infrastructure for our efforts to be more sustainable and long-term and permanent, right? So I just want to flag that uh, uh, from that point of view, right? So that those investments are very important investments as well, right? So- uh, That's helpful clarity, thank you. Yeah, right. Uh, can I go to Crystal? Crystal, can, can you quickly highlight the investments we have made so far? in uh, in uh, in a uh, uh, non market housing affordable housing as a municipality like no uh, cuz there's some narrative about there that we haven't that we are not stepping up just want to kind of sure come yeah through i can that narrative <laughs> Yeah, so I can speak to that for sure. Over the, um, you know, over our last four-year budget cycle, the city of Edmonton invested approximately 132 million dollars in affordable housing that generated over 2,800 new units of affordable housing. Um, obviously, working in partnership with other orders of government, but we were able to leverage that money considerably and, and construct almost a billion dollars of affordable housing um, through those contributions from the other orders as well. Uh, and then this year, we have another, uh, you know, a new 
investment cycle in underway and we have approximately 150 million dollars has been committed to that so far and potentially um, there may be some more as well and we're hoping to achieve at least as many units as we did last time um, over the next four years mm -hmm. and also some of the innovative ideas that we've been uh, able to uh, able to support Sure. Yeah, I think you know we're being nationally recognized for our uh, construction of supportive housing and we're, and the partnerships that we came up with um, around city land and working with Homeward Trust on that. Um, as far as other innovative, so there's a lot of. I mean, there's too many. Honestly, there's too many projects to name. But everything from adapting existing churches uh, into affordable housing to uh, bringing together different types of partnerships to meet the different needs of different priority populations. Uh, yeah, the city. I think you know, obviously. Bias, but we are very open to ideas from um, uh, from people externally and work really hard to try and um, come up with unique partnerships and new ways of solving the problem um, within you know the resource basis that's been provided to us. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I will move the second round. Second. Councilor Rice. Yes, I already voted. No, no, uh, you're chairing the meeting, sorry. Yes. We're just waiting on two votes. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Yeah, please dis display the votes. That is carried, and it's her chair to you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, okay, uh, next we will just hold on. I see the list. Here we go. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much. I I have I will I'm going to switch tracks and talk a little bit about something that I I felt um, I wasn't sure if it was intentional, and again, recognizing this was put together very quickly. I didn't know that many of the the ideas spoke to more of the, the housing side of the housing crisis with market housing and what we can do to, to bring more um, housing, uh, market housing on online. So just wondering, um, well, start with, well, I'll just delve right into the construction financing question. So that's something I'm, I'm hugely supportive of. What I'm hearing from industry is that there are very viable projects um, and they are just struggling with skittish banks who, who won't provide the construction period financing. So this is, you know, a two to five year loan. Um, just wondering what, what options have been explored to, to help address that gap, if any. I, I don't think a lot of options because I, 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 like I've said before, I don't think we want to be that bank um, as a city given some of the other risks we have. Uh, so I would say, I think the biggest thing we can do for market housing counselor is continue to do the next level of work we need to do on permitting and, and mm. making it really easy for speed and those kinds of things, which, which you know, uh, Kim and I are going to meet soon with a bunch of developers on what they, what is next on their priority list for us to move forward on. Yeah, well, I, I just want to go back to this question of using something like the Atel endowment, because um, just to clarify, I mean, that is, that is, a, that is an investment we invest the principal every every year. That's that's how we grow that fund. Is that correct? Yeah, and I'll just defer to Stacy if she wants to talk about specifics on that one. Well, yeah, maybe I'll just you know I was just looking at the 2022 investment report that we have uh, investment committee report, and again recognizing that 2022 was a wasn't a you know a difficult year. Um, Again, you know, we were looking at returns of 2% in the money market um, and actually negative 7.4% in the balanced fund. So, so we do, I guess I'm just unclear why, um, you know, investment using those funds in, in real estate, which would be sec secured in a way that, that stock markets aren't, would be an aberration or, or create any challenges in terms of the, the policies and ethic that we have around that principle. So maybe let me just start off by saying the money market and the balance fund, those are different from uh, the Edtel investment. Uh, that is city um, excess cash the city holds for things that need to be funded in the future and they're invested on the basis of what is the timing for that cash flow need. Mm -hmm. Edtel Endowment Fund took the principal from the sale of Edmonton Telephones 
which was roughly $450 million. And it's grown, uh, that principle, that principle grows um, as we invest it and it grows um, to inflation adjust the principal amount. So now it's close to a billion dollars and, and on that billion dollars, we earn dividends. So when you want to take and use that funding from EdTel, it will ultimately have an impact on your future uh, operating budgets because the dividends will decrease over time. Um, and that's secure, like we would have to reopen a bylaw and hold a public hearing. But can I just can I just clarify the assumption that that, that it would decrease the principal? Recognizing so you know looking at the ten year trend, the EdTel has has returned nine percent. The benchmark is seven point five percent. The, the rates that I'm hearing are needed are sort of in the in the eight to to ten percent range. So again, I'm just unclear why that would deplete the principal if we're earning a return on that investment. So sorry, maybe I'm unclear at what you're looking to do with the EdTel endowment fund. But if you use any of the principal, you will impact your ability to earn. But if we're using the principal to earn a return through short-term lending, I'm unclear what we're losing. I think you've gotten, uh, so you want to take the principal and lend it out to build affordable housing and earn a return. I think that is one, not something that's allowed by our investment policy and would definitely require a lot of work for us to look at. And two, introduces an element of risk over and above the risk that we would likely have in the portfolio. Okay, I'll come back for a few more questions, but appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. Councillor Prince Oh, sorry, Councillor. Thank you, Ms. Sorry, go ahead, Councillor Prince go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Ms. Kajenner, you know, the mayor, I was just wanted to follow up on what the mayor said about the narrative that the city is not stepping up. But typically, is the municipality's responsibility in their contribution towards affordable housing more about providing land than necessarily providing infrastructure or grants for infrastructure? Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, Councilor Principe, I think that's a good question. Obviously, like, I think it's fair to say historically municipalities across Canada have primarily contributed to affordable housing through the provision of land. Um, but for sure, that's not to say that some haven't been involved in capital. And, and but most importantly, I think the point stands is that, you know, municipalities have the least resources of the three orders of government um, to be able to contribute to housing. Uh, in, in, so, so the efforts on the part of the city, you know, that a position as a, as a leader is in part because recognizing those constraints, but also just that we've um, taken on a leadership role that's really helped to catalyze uh, development in our city. Right, okay. And I too am going to bring up a very unpopular suggestion uh, that many may not want to hear, but uh, I'll ask Ms. Padbury, uh, is there any uh, reconsideration, because one of the things, reconsideration, all recent uh, decisions with significant budgetary impacts. I'm not sure if this is necessarily a significant budgetary impact, but the bike lanes, $100 million being paid off over 25 years. Is that correct? Or 20 years? Uh, I need to double check, but I think it's 20. 20. Okay. So would it even be possible to reallocate that towards affordable housing? to be paid off over 20 years? So the issue we have with affordable housing is unless we own the asset, we actually can't borrow for it. Um, and so you would get yourself into another, um, an entire other scenario if the city starts to be the owner of affordable housing and it hasn't been our practice to own, to, to not to go down the path of owning a lot of affordable housing. Um, uh, the debt servicing on active transportation is $7 million a year. So if you weren't going to allocate the $100 million because it's difficult to allocate that because it's debt and it wouldn't necessarily be our asset, the operating budget impact of the debt servicing on that $100 million is $7 million a year. Okay. So not really a consideration? Is that what you're telling me? 
um, not probably not eligible for debt is what I'm I'm saying, um, and then only a small portion could be redirected from the operating budget. That would be the equivalent amount of the okay. debt servicing plus or sorry, yeah, the you're small saying. plus interest payments. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principal, Councillor Salvador. Um, yeah, and sorry, just looking at the time, um, do I have time for a round? Yeah, you know, uh, Councillor Stevenson has questions, others may have questions as well. So let's take a break here and we'll be back at 1.30.
Good afternoon. We are now live from Council Chambers. Okay, I would like to call this meeting back to order and do a roll call of council colleagues. Council Wright. Good afternoon. Councilor Knack. Councilor Prince Councilor Stevenson. Maybe I should wait. <laughs> uh, uh, our apologies, Mayor Sohi. It looks like we had mute on and nobody on li the line could hear us, so we might want to oh, try that Oh, that's what it was. Okay, got it. Okay, I would like to call this meeting back to order. Do a roll call, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Bay. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Paquette. Councillor Tang. Hello. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cardmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Okay, we are on to uh, our time specific item 3.4 Intergovernmental Update Integrator Encampment Response Process Verbal Report. And we'll go to administration for uh, uh, a presentation. Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, yeah, we're here to provide an update on the integrated encampment response process. We have uh, a large delegation, uh, and I won't name them all to save time, but we have a large delegation from administration, from the Edmonton Police Commission and the Edmonton Police Service. Uh, I don't have a rep from GOA here, but we'll try to present some of their points, and if, if we can't answer questions for them, we will uh, get back to you. So really appreciate you uh, us having this discussion and this is a continuation of the discussion we had on January 17th at the special council meeting. As we've uh, talked about previously, an encampment is not an adequate space for anyone. Our peace officers uh, and others have documented some of the dangers present in the encampments, including exposure to extreme weather, uh, victimization, significant safety concerns from inadequate structures and temporary heating using fuels and open flame. The city does have an encampment protocol that we follow to assess and action encampment sites of a variety of risk levels. At the January 17th meeting, we discussed the Government of Alberta's announcement to help support the encampment response by opening a navigation and support centre. As I will detail later in the presentation, uh, this support centre provides a multidisciplinary uh, triage and overnight shelter space to help people move away from encampments into more stable and safe housing forms. Recognizing there are many reasons why someone may live in an encampment, our approach needs to be adaptable and personalized to support the individual needs of each person. And as a result of the con continued efforts of the city team, uh, the HELP community partners, Mustard Seed, Bent Arrow, George Spady Society, and Radius Community Health and Healing, uh, the EPS and the GOA, um, we are now seeing uh, people begin journeys of housing to longer term healings uh, in higher numbers. Today we'll provide you with an update on our integrated efforts and in addition to representatives uh, from administration, like I said, we've got a commission and EPS reps here as well. And to begin the presentation, I'm going to ask David Jones to provide an update on the encampment reports and some of the trends we've been seeing over the few, last few weeks. David. Uh, good afternoon and thanks, Andre. As previously reported, uh, 311 received over 17,000 complaints about encampments across the city in 2023. 
Uh, we are forecasting another busy year of encampment complaints as uh, January 2023 started with only 206 calls to 311. Uh, and by the end of 2023, the city was receiving an average of uh, 1,435 uh, calls each month. With that said, the current um, the current encampment approach is showing early positive results. The consolidation of resources under the Emergency Operations Center has decreased response times and assessment times for encampments on public property by 27% from 9.1 days to 6.6 .6 days overall. The ability to close high risk and unsafe encampments on public lands has almost doubled when compared to January, 2023 and increased by 61% when compared to as recently as December, 2023. As of February 7th, there were 33 encampment sites in the queue waiting for initial assessment and inspection compared to 221 at the beginning of the year. Eight were scheduled for closure and cleaning, usually on, an, on a daily basis. And the majority of sites, 133, are confirmed to be vacant and are waiting to be cleaned by our city crews. These numbers change daily as new 311 calls are received and our team continues to assess and prioritize encampments. Crystal will now review the current state of shelters and Indigenous led shelters. And I thought I saw Crystal online, but uh, we'll just double check that she's here. It appears that she just, oh, she should be back now. Hi, I'm so sorry. I'm just having, I was just having some audio issues there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Thanks, David. Just I had to reboot my computer. So I'm just opening the presentation. If you need a minute, I can jump in for you, Crystal. Uh, you Never mind. Thanks, David. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so as council has emphasized, when somebody leaves an encampment, they need a safe and welcoming place to go. Administration has been diligent in focusing on both shelter capacity and implementing our uh, aspirational minimum shelter standards, with one of the more, most important steps being access to 24-7 spaces where residents are not continually displaced. We are also working with our partners to increase the diversity of our offerings to become, to be welcoming and suitable for all people and situations, including indigenous people, younger adults and couples. Following recent funding by government, the government of Alberta, overall shelter capacity in Edmonton has increased. All spaces operate 24 seven. And as of February 12th, 1,579 spaces are open for use. In a show of additional support during the recent extreme weather activation, the Al Rashid Mosque operated an additional 50 spaces, which operated an average 74% capacity. Al Rashid also operated day shelter spaces on January 13th and 14th on a voluntary basis to support the extreme cold response. Work is ongoing related to indigenous led shelter spaces. Despite making up only 6% of Edmonton's overall population, according to the to Homeward Trust's by names list, 56% of Edmontonians experiencing homelessness are Indigenous, and the vast majority of emergency shelter spaces in Edmonton are provided by non-Indigenous organizations. In order to help address culturally appropriate spaces, two separate expressions of interest have, had been completed, one for Indigenous-led shelter spaces and a second for Indigenous-led transitional spaces. From those two EOIs, four projects are being advanced to address Indigenous homelessness in Edmonton. Two Indigenous-led shelter spaces uh, are in progress. The first is Niganan Housing Venture Stabilization Space, uh, which provides 87 spaces, uh, and they're fully operational at the old Sands Hotel site. 
Niganan has converted a space for shelter purposes and added trailers and pallet shelters in the parking lot. The city received notification of an appeal for the temporary development permit for the trailer spaces at Niganan. The Subdivision and Developmental Appeal Board uh, is scheduled to hold a public hearing on February 20th, 2024. Uh, and the second is the Enoch Cree Nation project at the Coliseum Inn with 80 spaces currently open and up to 100 shelter spaces uh, will be available when fully operational. City staff are working closely with the operators to ensure that all city processes are being delivered efficiently and to glean any lessons learned from these operations. This will aid us in helping to facilitate future Indigenous led shelters. The third, uh, the multi agency collaboration or collaborative Indigenous led permanent shelter is still in progress as we work with the sector in a collaborative effort to design what a purpose built Indigenous shelter could look like. The Indigenous led transitional space expression of interest is also in progress. By bringing together a multi-agency collaborative working group, the Indigenous-led transitional space draft plan is being formed. Currently, the expression of interest open space transitional space report has been developed by a consultant and delivered to the city staff and Indigenous stakeholders seeking feedback. A progress report will be brought to council on the EOI later this year. I'll pass it on to Andre to review the current response process. Thank you, David. Um, as first discussed a few weeks ago, the city is supporting other colleagues at EPS and the GOA in an encampment response plan that introduces additional support mechanisms, uh, namely the Navigation Support Centre, as well as the Emergency Operations Centre. The Emergency Operations Centre was activated January 17th to coordinate the logistics and resources of this response and is being jointly operated with the Office of Emergency Management as the lead and Edmonton Police Services. The EOC has uh, existing resources and expertise to provide management coordination pre for prevention, mitigation and response activities, which makes it a natural fit for the coordination role. There are four phases in this coordinated response approach, some of which have been adjusted since we spoke with you in January. Phase one is the assessment and notice. This team includes COE staff, park rangers, peace officers, EPS, fire, rescue, and we've uh, endeavoured to get REACH involved in this and they have uh, certainly uh, taken part once or twice and we're working towards that being a more permanent fixture. Uh, occupants are given time to gather and remove personal belongings before a site is cleared and this step uh, will continue to exist. And ensuring time to gather and organize belongings is a critical principle of our encampment response and one way to ensure that individuals are treated with dignity in a challenging situation. Uh, we have learned that too much advance notice of closure can expose our staff to additional risks, including the presence of booby traps, third parties on site interfering and, uh, and others interfering with the closure process. Phase two, site resolution. During closure and cleaning days, EPS and GOA sheriffs arrive on site to guide the closure of the site. I will note that more and more they are reducing their presence to close these sites because they're simply not required. And I see daily updates that say actually we need less uh, folks there. So they're actually taking a different approach and reducing their presence as required. Uh, the city operations crews uh, enter the site once it's vacant and begin the process of cleaning as you've seen. And then transportation, which is phase three, transportation from the encampment site is now provided through the GOA sheriffs using city ETS contracted buses for those displaced during an encampment enclosure. And individuals affected by the closure are transported to the navigation support center, which leads us to the fourth, fourth and final sta stage or phase. Phase four, the triage and reception. The new pass helped to address each individual encampment occupant situation more effectively and in a more coordinated way. Path one offers a direct transportation to the navigation support center opened by the GOA. Path two is direct transportation to the integrated care center and the ICC will provide immediate access to medical and addiction services. Path three results in EPS executing warrants uh, and transporting individuals uh, from there. And finally, path four results when paths two and three don't apply to an individual and they decline supports offered through path one and leave the site on their own. The other thing I would add is that uh, in addition to people coming from encampments to the navigation centre, uh, they are receiving drop-ins and there a few times we have uh, uh, transported folks from uh, some of our transit closures that, that are tied to the transit safety plan. I will now ask uh, Deputy Chief Lazenby to review some of the impacts uh, support of the support navigation centre. 
David. Thanks, Andre. The Emergency Operations Centre is activated to support a coordinated approach to encampment closures with the Government of Alberta and Edmonton Police Services. The primary objectives are to address public health and safety concerns, improve the living conditions of homeless Edmontonians, and facilitate access to support services and altern alternative shelter via the Navigation Centre. The UOC supports approach supports intergovernmental coordination of resources and re-emphasizes the importance of this strategic center and includes twice daily meetings with all the response teams from the GOA, EPS and the City of Edmonton. The City is playing a support role. It's important to remember that the navigation center, including which services are provided and which groups are supporting it, is organized by the GOA. During this operation, the city has paused its work with our key partners, such as Homewood Trust, Boyle Street and Vissel Centre, who regularly work with the city via a steering committee on our encampment response. Historically, their support has helped drive data coordination, human-centred design, planning, continuous improvement, evaluation and issues management. Although non, not directly involved in this EOC encampment response, the city continues to value these positive relationships and would explore opportunities to resume the partnership depending on future decisions and operational response. To date, closures have not been met with issues. As of February the 8th, the team had closed and cleaned 191 encampment sites. Of the 271 occupants of these encampments, over 52% of the people engaged, 143 of them, chose to accept transportation to the navigation and support centre to receive assistance and support. All of these 143 people were transported on contracted Edmonton Transit Service vehicles with on-bus supports provided by the health team. More on those services provided in the Navigation Centre will be provided in upcoming slides. Next slide, please. From an environmental health and fire safety perspective, cleanup is a critical step in restoring these spaces for public use. From the previous slide, you saw that of the total encampments closed and cleans, as of February the 8th, it resulted in over 158,000 kilograms of waste, including more than 520 shopping carts and 3,200 needles. Over 569 propane tanks were recovered, which is significant, as we know that the use of open flames in tents is one of the highest risks occupants can face because using propane tanks and other fire sources has the potential to result in accidents, injury and death. This winter season, there have been three confirmed deaths in encampments as a result of fire. Although not discussed often, early encampment cleanup and remediation is critical from an infrastructure maintenance perspective too. In 2023, the city incurred approximately $1.3 million in unanticipated costs from major incident damage to critical infrastructure resulting from encampments, mostly related to fires. This includes damages to bridges, three major playground fires, and the repair and full replacement of two River Valley wooden staircases. These costs are covered by a mixture of insurance and unbudgeted operating and capital expenses. The current response process of the EOC activation allows for collaboration and expedited response with the city's infrastructure maintenance team for preventative strategies and expedited repairs. In addition, the city is providing limited animal control support to the centre. These supports including transferring animals from the Hope Mission location to the Boyle Street location and supporting with aggressive animals if needed. As of February the 8th, 11 animals have, been, have arrived with individuals at the centre, six dogs and five cats. The city's support includes transporting animals to shelters that may accept them upon request and responding to aggressive animals on site. The city has also provided food and toys and shelters for the pets. I'll now pass it back to Andrew. Thank you, David. Um, so we believe the new navigation support centre has shown positive results so far. As of Thursday, February 8th, more than 231 individuals have come to the centre, either through direct transportation from an, a closed encampment site or through occasional walk-up requests for support. While the centre was initially intended for people experiencing encampment closure, it appears word is spreading on the on-site supports and the instances of walk-ups from unsheltered persons are increasing. No unsheltered person has been turned away as far as we know. Organisations are working together to provide the right support needed for each individual and the coordination effort is really helping. 
Of note, the difference that is shown in the total number of people attending the center is due to the fact that our numbers reported in the previous table are a result of our daily um, EOC data collection. The Government of Alberta may release data uh, that includes additional walk-ups or referrals that we don't know about from other social agencies that occur after our daily data collection is done. So as a result, the GOA numbers are the best and most accurate numbers because it includes both what we're involved in directly with and what happens uh, that we may not be aware of with the, with the, on, with the, um, the walk-ins. Uh, the centre center has shown that dedicated supports are resulting in faster and more direct service provision to those who need it. More than 120 people have been connected to shelter and more importantly, 65 referrals to housing have been made since the encampment resp response process started in mid-January. Referrals to housing means the number of people connected or reconnected to the housing teams funded by Homeward Trusts. This would include Housing First teams who can house uh, people in market, housing with supports, and permanent supportive housing spaces. Hope Mission is the primary agency supporting the Navigation Centre. They are, they are connecting with other agencies including Mustard Seed, Enoch, the Salvation Army, and other housing teams. Radius and Health, Radius Health and Treaty 6 Confederacy are also, are also intimately involved in the Navigation and Support Centre. At this point, one of our gaps is we do not have data telling us how many people referred to housing have actually been provided with housing or still in housing. Typically, it takes some time to work with each individual to understand their needs, and this is a gap that I'm committed to trying to resolve with our partners so that we can track the data uh, further along through the system. Because the tracking of successes would be uh, monitored by other teams, we'll work towards uh, collaborating with them and getting to that point because that's so important. Over 90 people have been provided with medical assistance. This included several persons from encampments who were treated for cold weather injuries. Some were very severe during the first week of the center's operation. More than 117 individuals have received temporary identification cards directly on site with permanent IDs provided within a week. And this kind of dedicated coordinated service for encampment occupants is critical to receiving other services and supports and has reduced the wait time for IDs down from an average of four to six weeks to much faster. In addition, uh, over 80 individuals have been provided with transportation from the navigation centre to other locations, most often a shelter of their choice, but also includes detox centres, friends or families. Transportation outside the city to anywhere in Canada is also being offered, but to date no one has yet uh, taken up that offer. The GOA is committed to reviewing the centre and supporting a camera response process after 30 days of operations to determine ongoing service provisions and we'll step, definitely update council on that and I have personally suggested that we need to continue this on for a period of time so we, we have made that formal request. Uh, as the, meter, the mayor has discussed previously, he's convened two meetings with social services leaders who support people with lived experience. Uh, although she is not here today, Jennifer Flamin and the Edmonton Police Service attended both meetings to support the conversation. In the first conversation, the city team did review the process for the eight high-risk sites, which have been updated to explicitly include confirmation of sufficient shelter capacity, oversight from the Deputy City Manager, Community Services for specific conditions, notifications to City Council, closure notifications to uh, residents and to social service agencies. In the second conversation, e uh, Edmonton Police Service shared early insights about how the new four-path process was working. Some of the agencies in the conversation are also part of the centre and spoke to the success of having so many supports in one location to facilitate immediate uh, access to identification, health services and housing. Although there is much work to do, there was a sense of relief that the pressures were starting to ease as well as a sense of integration and shared purpose. This collaborative community team has identified the following opportunities for improvement, which we're committed to um, following through on. Reviewing the processes and decisions considering and considering lived experience. For instance, this is ensuring that extreme weather warming buses are operating at the most relevant windows for people as they are leaving facilities. Specifically related to the sector capacity, the groups are looking for continued communication from the city Edmonton and Edmonton Police Service to let them know when they should anticipate demand spikes so they can staff accordingly. And within the sector, they are looking for better data management processes to understand and communicate real capacity for shelters and other temporary accommodations, as well as the status of those shelters as they relate to our minimum shelter standards. 
Continued focus on supporting youth and other user groups who have needs that are not adequately addressed by the existing shelter system. Several of the agencies spoke to the concern that youth are the hardest to track through the system as they tend to be more mobile between various forms of hopelessness, including couch surfing, shelters, and sleeping rough. Differing intake requirements for, for standard shelters. And finally, mainstream shelters, Indigenous-led shelters, prefer to take smaller, more comprehensive intake volumes to allow them to work one-on-one -on -one with folks on their specific needs. And this means that they cannot take necessarily high-volume referrals. In partnership with Homer Trust, we are working through all of this feedback. And where possible, we're also including the feedback in our advocacy efforts with the Government of Alberta and the Government of Canada as they contemplate their next steps to support houseless Edmontonians. The Mayor committed to facilitating one more conversation with the extended group once the Navigation Support Centre was operational for a period of time. And this will allow another opportunity for social service leaders to provide their insights on the approach and gather any lessons learned for future extreme weather events. Homeward Trust will determine how their existing conversation tables can be leveraged as well to keep this collaborative team connected as we continue to support Edmontonians transitioning away from encampments into more stable forms of housing. So that completes our formal presentation and we'd be happy to take any questions you have as you continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Now we will open the conversation for uh, uh, questions. I'm just looking at uh, just um. So this is needed to be, uh, this is for information, right? So we need a motion on the floor. Can someone move that uh, we move to receive for information? If there's subsequent, we can deal with that later. So, so moved. Okay, thank you. Because we need a motion on the Second. floor to uh, start the discussion. Okay, Councillor Stevenson, go ahead. Sorry, Councillor Wright, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, Andre, um, the, we were promised, I think, what was it, 17, 1800 shelter spaces by November 1st. Are those all in place now? Yeah, the, the 1700 shelter spaces minimum are in place. Um, and uh, I'm just looking for the number. Um, we, As of February 12th, we had, wait a second, yeah. Um, so I'm, actually, I need to defer to Crystal on this one okay. to make sure, because I want to make sure we get this right. Crystal, are, are we there yet? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> no, are, there, um, are the shelter spaces in place yet? Yes, that's correct. Funding for all 1,700 spaces has been provided to all of the operators. Uh, there's still one facility that is waiting to get uh, become operational, but it should be imminent. Currently, there's um, 1,559 total open. 1,559. Oh, I thought that was a number that we heard back in December. So... No further movement, e even with these new ones, like the no, the there has net? there has yeah there has been some movement have, for sure because in uh, December Enoch Shelter was only open for ten and now they're up to eighty. Okay, uh, okay, yeah. So most of most of the capacity that's planned for this winter has come online now, um, like with the exception of a couple um, facilities that are not fully okay. up. Okay, so still also... still not where we needed to be at November 1st. Okay, um, and then I'm just wondering, the need to have this separate site, you know, I mean, Boyle and Bissell and, you know, other agencies have been working with people. They've got the data. They've established relationships with individuals. Uh, you know, and I know Alberta Supports already has, like, people in C5 Hub, so why couldn't they be doing that same thing and providing those supports within the existing agencies that are there i think i think that's a good question counselor and i you know i i i think what we're seeing in this uh support center is more different agencies involved more indigenous um uh, like enoch involved in sort of receiving people we're seeing a better coordination effort so I, I don't know the answer to your okay. question. Why were we not seeing that before? And I don't want to make a speculate on, on, on that as to why, but I, and, and I think the partners have been doing a good job, but I, but what we're finding is this effort is more coordinated, I would say. Yeah. I'm just wondering why they couldn't coordinate it within existing. Um, 
Okay, my other question is in regards to um, the safety concerns, uh, Deputy Chief, maybe. I I'm wondering if, if some of the, the pressure to, to close some of these high-risk encampments got, got to be more high-risk um, when people found out that they were going to be moved? Like, um, like with the, you know, with the booby traps and that that have been mentioned. Like, were they in place before they were notified that they were going to be moved, or were they were they put in place after? No, I, I think what we we've uh, experienced with the eight eight closures prior to this particular initiative was that um, you know fed parties were coming onto site and things like that and causing you know, ad, ad, additional considerations for the responding staff. And we're finding with a more prompt response, we're able to alleviate some of those concerns and keep our staff safe and everybody on site safe. And it, and it seems to be working well, Councillor. Okay. Um, and then I had one other question. My time's running out. Oh, no. Um, oh, the, the total waste going to the landfills. I know in your on the slide here, it said 158,000. Um, you know, can we, what, could some of that have been diverted if, if people were allowed to stay there in the encampments? Like, because they're just, you know, they're going out and finding more tents and that, um, setting back up again. Maybe I'll take a crack. I, okay. I don't think so, Councillor, because I think we're, we're not, the waste is waste. It's waste whether it's people are there or not, um, I would say. It's not um, because, you know, we're encouraging and people have the time to take their, their, um, their effects. So I think that waste would just still be there. But if they don't have the ability to move it, yeah, they're going to have to leave it. I'll come back for Not necessarily, because oh. we've actually transported some people's belongings for them to independent to, to shelters as well. So it's not necessarily what you've said there. So. Okay. Good. Okay. Thanks. I, Thank I think the thing I would add as well is, you know, when we go to some encampments, some of the, the tents have been kind of uh, just left behind pr prior to our, any engagement by us. So... You know, it's not necessarily the case that every single tent that you see within an encampment environment is occupied. So some of it is genuine waste that's been left behind that could and should be, be cleaned up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jans. Thank you so much. I was just wondering, I'm looking at page six here. So the, numer the numerator is we've had 143 people accepting transportation to the Navigation Center from encampments. What's the denominator? How many people have we interacted with altogether? I'll take that one. So as of um, the situation report we had on February the 12th, we'd engaged with 271 occupants um, in total. That's out February the 12th, so a little ahead of um, kind of maybe the, when this slide deck was created. Um, so yeah, in total, 271. So uh, as the slides said, you know, just we're, we're experiencing, and this has been fairly consistent, approximately just over 50% of the people that we engage with are taking up, up the offer of um, transportation to the navigation center. And yeah. just, I'll just yeah, add, Councillor, as of today, so, uh, it's 282 is okay. the uh, denominator and 152 is the numerator. Right. Um, this is anecdote, but just from my personal experience, it seems like I'm seeing more folks in the transit centres and I'm certainly seeing more folks on the south side. Do we have a sense of the other 48% where they're going? Are, they, are we seeing an increase in... Um, in particular, a couple of the other LRT stations I can think of are hotspots, and I can think of a transit center as well. And this David, is what I've just seen firsthand. David, can um, you speak to that? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in on that. That's one of the, um, you know, potential consequences that we know that we ha have been tracking. And what I can say that, uh, you know, we haven't noticed an increase, especially uh, at, at the times when we're shutting down uh, transit centers at the end of service. Uh, we haven't seen an increase. We haven't seen numbers even as great as we did last winter. Uh, so um, 
you know, something that we thought we might need to uh, to address, and it hasn't really, um, uh, you know, it hasn't really become an issue apart from uh, what you know what the numbers that we're normally seeing in transit spaces. I also so I think say, that a factor there, Council, is some of the warm weather we've had in the last few weeks as well. To be fair, yeah. Uh, so, so I'm sorry, I don't understand. It, so, well, I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back to that. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. The um, just with regards to warrants and the other pathway, how many people have been either arrested or detained or or. I'll see if EPS want. I, I believe the number we have is four, but I'll just see if EPS wants to uh, answer that question. Yeah, thank you, Superintendent Keith Johnson, EPS. Uh, yes, the number is, uh, number of people that have been arrested at the encampments have been four. Uh, those occurred probably when we were dealing with the most entrenched encampments around the first seven days of operations for about, for about the first uh, week and a half, Councillor. Does that be in the January period? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, what about um, other folks with outstanding warrants? Have they been processed or, because I recall there's sort of the three pathways. Yeah, as part of that, uh, it's very important uh, from a EPS perspective. Uh, it's, it's, always been, it's always been about the path to get vulnerable people to the services that they need. That's our, that's our first focus. And then when we talk about uh, the criminal element and the predators that are in those encampments, this, ex this expedited process that we've instituted with our city partners, when they find out we're coming, the criminal element leaves. So when we're there on scene, we're dealing strictly with the true vulnerable at that time. And there's no real direct uh, interaction between the police and, uh, and the vulnerable. It's Hope, it's Mustard Seed, George Spady, Ben Terrell, and Radius. So they're having that conversation at that point. And that's why we've seen such a good success in getting those folks to voluntarily get transported to the NAV Center. So just to paraphrase, if I've got this, in November, there were folks who had warrants and there was a criminal element that were hanging out in encampments. In December, January, the decision was made to clear the encampments and as such, uh, the criminal element has such dissipated or gone elsewhere. And the folks who are in the encampments remaining are the most vulnerable and they are being cleared and they are being assisted in getting to pathways um, such as this NAV center. However, 48% of them are taking uh, are not going and we're still trying to figure out a path to help those people. Is that, do I have this correct? Well, from the from the criminal element piece is that, yeah, we they are leaving. We're seeing some congregations, uh, it was just noted here on the weekend, that uh, there's been a lot more congregations, a little bit more on street corners in front of the convenience, certain convenience stores, where in the past is that uh, these convenience stores have been uh, targeted by our HSOC members because they are selling uh, weapons. Uh, either it's bear sprays, machetes, uh, contraband tobacco. So uh, the positive aspect of it as part of looking forward is, is that uh, now that criminal element, those predators are a lot more visible. Uh, the intel documents that I receive on a weekly basis, I'm getting more and more names uh, that we're able to uh, uh, send to our HSOC and our downtown beat specifically, as well as our south side. Uh, that they can keep a lookout for these folks with serious, serious violent warrants attached to them. Okay. Thank you. Thank Councilor you. Gans. Uh, Councilor uh, Stevenson. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the report. And there, there is a lot that's encouraging in this. So, uh, you know, really want to start off by acknowledging that. And um, did, did want to get a bit of clarity, though, just in terms of some of the timelines that we're talking about. So, Mr. Corbold, you talked about some of the tensions around uh, minimum notice. Um, I, I'm just struggling to understand what our notice period is and how much time we're providing for folks. Um, it, it was mentioned that there's about a 6.6 .6 day f lag uh, from registration to evaluation. How quickly are our encampments being removed? Uh, or what, what's the notice period that they're receiving? Yeah, so the notice period is very different from what the when we did the encampments of doing the few the few days. We're not providing that advanced notice in the same way we did before, which is proving more effective because we're still allowing people all the time they need to to collect their things. But um, uh, as I indicated, that was a safety issue for staff in many ways. So yeah, I'll just see if somebody wants to. Um, 
advise exactly what notice is being given, maybe perhaps from EPS. Yeah, if I could, uh, Keith Johnson again, EPS. Yeah, if we can speak about the process, the, the 48, 48 hours notice is, is something that has really created a positive impact. Uh, the, you know, we know through the 17,000 complaints from 2023 that Edmontonians do not want encampments. But we also know that Edmontonians want us to deal with these encampments in a very compassionate way. So with the 200 plus, uh, 200 and I believe 61 uh, NAV Centre uh, that have gone to the NAV Centre uh, since, uh, since this project has started are 261 that would not have attended. Uh, there would be much less people accessing supports. So moving forward is, is that this is nothing but a positive, uh, a positive initiative because again, we're focusing purely on ensuring the vulnerable people are getting access to services. And on a secondary level, decreasing crime and disorder, I can speak that we've seen a marked decrease sure. in the number of occurrences in the past month. Yep. And then lastly is identifying gaps in services as well. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. So just, just to clarify, so encampments are being provided 48 hours notice before they're removed? No, 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 no. Just, just to clarify that we've we, we've reduced that time frame because, as as uh, my colleagues have indicated, because of the concerns around staff safety, and typically now it's same day notification. So we're giving people ample time to collect their belongings. They're being provided with totes to gather together those belongings, and then those are transported with the individuals to the navigation centre. Um, so we're trying to strike a balance between staff safety and allowing people time to gather their belongings together and then being offered transportation to the center. Okay, well, that, that provides clarity. I'm wondering, um, maybe to both EPS and then to our city teams as well, uh, what do your teams do if they come across an encampment that hasn't yet uh, been, been assessed? With those ones is that uh, we're seeing let's say if an encampment has been closed and then uh, we do follow ups the following day. And the positive aspect of that is, is that we're not seeing a re entrenchment of the encampments because it's about, you know, it's there's managing the encampments and then there's the entrenched encampments. And that's where uh, the whole initiative, the expedited process of closing the encampments, uh, if we're able to reduce the entrenchments, that allows us to a uh, deal with the, uh, the the, violent piece, the violence piece that has been occurred in the past, the less fires, uh, the less stolen property, um, the assaults, the human trafficking, I, mean, I, I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, but the aspect of that is, is that we do have them encouraging them to, uh, uh, to pack up and go to a place that, where they can uh, access services. We're seeing that now in a few uh, instances where you'll see an encamp, or sorry, you'll see a tent, not an encampment, but you'll see a tent maybe in a back alley, it's late at night where uh, someone is there sleeping, but following up the next morning, 9 a.m., uh, that individual uh, is packing up the tent, uh, cleaning, and then moving on to uh, what we hope to be uh, one of the uh, day spaces uh, where, they can, uh, where they can access, you know, all the services that they require. Uh, that's a marked change that we've seen. Thank you. I'm just running out of time, but I'll come back just to, to understand that difference between encampments and, and individual tents. Thank you. Thank you. Closer neck. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sophie. I, well, actually, maybe I'll, I'll ask a little bit about that. I just wanted to to get a sense. Uh, similar to Councillor Jans, I, I um, was out door knocking over the weekend and, and held a community town hall uh, about a week and a half ago in, in the West End community that um, the, the anecdotal information, this goes back to trying to get clear information one way or another, is that, that we're starting to see um, a greater increase. So, for example, in the West End right now of, of maybe not an encampment, like where you have five or six people before you see more tents popping up. So we, do we have any clear way of knowing whether that's accurate or not? It's one thing to hear it from people who are seeing it, but, but maybe the numbers aren't um, as much as they, they might think it is so yeah I, I would say counselor given you know the short time that we've been at this it's gonna be very hard to you know specifically yeah. track where people go I I would say that it, 
you know, our, our view is that it's less than anticipated with, with the moving around. Um, and I think it's because more people, um, you know, we didn't anticipate over 50% sort of connection rate in the first few weeks, but we got that pretty quickly. So uh, I, I, I don't doubt that there's been some movement for sure. Uh, but with all the other factors, including the, the re re recent very positive weather, uh, it's really hard to track at this point. Um, right. That's why I, I, I figured we're, we're early days, so we need more data and, and information on that. So no problem. I just wanted Here's. to ask that based off what I've been hearing the last sort of week and a half. Um, so the 52 percent, again, just so I can make sure I understand, and then I'll, I'll let uh, folks from EPF to answer that as well, is folks accessing services, not necessarily housing or like they might be getting healthcare, they might be getting, I, I saw the slide and I'm just drawing, I need to try to pull it up again. So are those folks actually accessing like a permanent solution or are they just accessing some type of healthcare support or ID support? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the different individuals. And yeah. um, and I think, like I said, one of the, ga the data gaps for us that we need to close, I think with the uh, help of Homer Trust and others is, what happens after the referral. So 65 as of February 8th were referred to housing. What I can't tell you is how many of those 65 are actually in housing this morning and have they successfully transitioned. That's a gap for us right. that we, we are very committed to, to, uh, to building and understanding what's happened with those folks, which, uh, but, but we're not there yet. Understandable. Again, yeah, that's fair. That's, that's good. Um, just wanted to remind myself, I, I know the with the provincial funding to get us, and we'll be at that 1700 very soon, as, as we heard from Ms. Kajener uh, recently. Um, are all of those 1700 now completely permanent, just to, or, or what, what number will be permanent on an ongoing basis this year? Um, I don't... Has the province told us that yet? I don't think we know that for sure. I, I definitely believe, that as, and I've said this before publicly, once we once we build the 1700 spaces, once they're operational, once we get used to them, unless we start solving the homelessness issue, I think it's gonna be very difficult for those spaces to be taken away. Taken away. I mean, the reality is, as you know, there was, a, there was an imbalance. And I think, uh, right. again, much credit to the data chase all, all our teams did. We, we finally got agreement and clarity on the actual data. And as a result of that, the, um, the province stood up their shelter spaces. So I think Councillor Knack that as long as we maintain accurate data and we continue to talk with the province about what the actual data is, I, I don't see they would reduce those spaces, but it's not a guarantee. And we, we definitely have to make sure we're at continuing to have those conversations. The fact is those spaces are being used. And so I Thanks don't that. see why we would reduce them as long as they continue to be used. Okay, great. Uh, the last question I, I had, and sorry, I might have to come back around because I know EPS wanted to answer, but uh, just to jump in is, um, so let's assume, because I know we had our, our report, 1,400 to 1,700 permanent supportive housing units required. Um, how many spaces are open today? So somebody goes to the reception center looking to get into a recovery bed, looking to get into a supportive housing unit. We, we touched on the, the number of folks looking for referrals. How many spaces are open today? Do, do we have that information from the province? Uh, you know, I know there's a shortfall overall, but but I'm curious if if 50 people showed up to the reception center today, would they all have? A, are there enough spaces that they could go into recovery bed or housing, or are we are we waiting to address that backlog right now as well? I can or take is, a crack that, is that a problem? Is that a question better answered by the province at this point? Uh, well, I could take a crack at that just to say that although there isn't widespread um, capacity on the permanent supportive housing side, which is why we're working to generate more spaces, there is some capacity on the bridge housing side. And um, so it would, so depending on the individual, some folks would be referred to bridge housing from the navigation center and would be able to access that. Uh, and others would be um, waiting to be connected to permanent housing and maybe not taking bridge in the interim. And that process can take some time. Um, but obviously with some of the improvements to speed and process put in place, the navigation center, hopefully less time than what we were seeing previously. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Nack. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and thank you for, for the update and the presentation. Um, yeah, so just starting with with a pretty pretty big clarifying question. Um, so now that the province and EPS are really taking the lead on this work, I just need to understand who's taking the lead on the actual risk assessment. 
that's still us? Like the, the risk matrix is still in play? Yes, Councillor, the risk matrix is still in play. We're doing it with our partners, but the City of Edmonton's leading that. Okay. Um, and then I just want to loop back, going back a few weeks, um, I, at that time, I was intending on, on making a motion just to um, provide some direction around some potential changes to the risk matrix. So I just want to follow up on that to see um, just the status of some of those points. Uh, so at that time, I was looking for some additional social sector um, input, feedback uh, when it comes to our high risk response. It sounds like that has happened. It ha is happening. Is that right? We, we have had some response and some recommendations uh, as I tried to say in my briefing, I don't think we've implemented 100% of those, and, and we're, but we're continued to, to working. And as I indicated, the mayor is going to have a, a third meeting. So I think by that time, not sure when that is yet, we'll be able to have implemented all those. Um, I think, um, yeah, so, so I think I would say it's in progress, Councillor, and more, still more work to do. Same with the risk matrix. We're still open to ideas and concepts from the social sector and how we might want to change that risk matrix and then finally the assessment piece we we have had some support ride-alongs with our assessment teams but we haven't yet got to a point where we're in completely we've completely embedded the social sector into our assessments for every day and that's so that's still more work to be done right okay i appreciate that and um yeah, I agree that that's a, an important part of this conversation. Um, I was also interested in uh, sort of ongoing improvement reassessment of the cold weather threshold um, for for all encampments. And where where is that piece at? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I can defer to David if he's got information on that. I think, you know, what we've also seen in the last few weeks is the colder it gets, the more urgent it is to get people to the supports. And now that we're getting more people more quickly to those supports, we, we think um, w at this point, I would say, we don't think we should delay the movement based on a colder temperature. We should get people to uh, warm places, whether they be shelters or housing. Okay, and uh, just around the reasons for, for encampment, um, assessments being deemed high risk it how how is that being communicated um just you know desire to improve some transparency there that was one of the things that i was looking for previously yeah so i think one of the things is we've published the risk matrix david can you talk more about that lazenby or jones Sorry, jones i thought but <laughs> yeah in your acting uh, capacity as dcm of community service yeah you bet um, so we are we are continually, as Andre said, we are continually taking feedback on that risk assessment, that risk matrix, um, and uh, certainly uh, evaluating things that came up through the lawsuit as well. Um, but uh, with respect to any changes, that's going to be, you know, it'll take some time. Um, so, sorry, can you repeat exactly so what you're that's, looking for that? that's, that's helpful. That's good. And I'm just looking at my time. So I do want to ask a slightly different question with my remaining minute. Um, yeah, switching gears a bit. So the Indigenous led transition space, the EOI that's, uh, that's been advanced for, I think it was four projects. I, I just need some additional detail. Like what, what can you share with those four projects? I know, um, they were, they were in bullet points high level here, but, uh, yeah. What, what else can you tell us? Uh, Crystal, can you do that one? Oh, sorry. Um, go ahead, Eric, Councillor Salvador, what you were asking about. Sure, can you elaborate on the Indigenous-led transitional yes. space EOI, the four projects? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we are working, uh, there's a few different pieces to that. We're working with four different proponents. The first one is the um, we're looking, working with Niganan to see if we can convert uh, the lounge at the Sands Hotel into permanent uh, stabilization housing or some type of uh, emergency shelter. It's currently being used that way, but it's not. Um, it's very transitional and ad hoc, and we're trying to work to make that a more permanent facility. Uh, another piece that we're working with is on uh, the a potential outdoor solution or a solution that would inc incorporate some type of, um, you know, like a tiny home or sort of a, a different type of solution um, that incorporates a land-based component. And that's being um, 
worked on uh, a program that's been worked on with uh, an architect that we've retained and, the, and a bunch of groups that came forward in that EOI as per council's request that we include that component to it. So we're working on a program for that right now and there will be a report on that completed shortly. Uh, the third component is there is a, another group of stakeholders that's come forward to support designing a program for an, a purpose-built Indigenous-led shelter. And so we're working with them to um, come up, just started that, starting that work now, do the program for a building so that, that would inform things like location choice or costing and that sort, and that sort of information. Um, and then the last one is just continuing to keep an, a line open with Enoch because uh, they were the fourth proponent that had submitted and they're working on the shelter at Coliseum Inn and we're just um, there to support them in terms of seeing you know how that process goes and seeing what their future might be in terms of shelter delivery if they want to um, continue in that arrangement or go in or move into a different direction but either way we have a line open with them that we're uh, you know engaged in communicating with them to see how we can be supportive. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Councilor Rice, can you take the chair, please? Uh, yes. Thank you. Sure. I'll just follow up on that, Crystal. So, what, so what, what are the kind of timelines on, uh, on, on figuring out these four proposals? Uh, so, we are planning to come back with a report uh, to Council or Committee later this year, um, I'd say like mid this year, so towards the summertime. Like I said, we just are, we have a draft report from the outdoor component and now the same architect has been retained to do the program on the purpose-built shelter piece. So we need some time for that process to go through that process. Uh, we had hired an indigenous architect to do that. And so we're hoping to be back um, around summertime this year with that report um, with more information. And we also have a third uh, consultant that's working on the costing and planning for the Niganan stabilization piece. So that is work as well underway as well, but it just, just mm -hmm. needs some time got to it. complete. And so we're hoping to be back um, in spring, late to summer this year. Okay, got it. Uh, on the, I think we also had, uh, uh, I think our goal to house close to 1,000, no, 100 people uh, as part of encampment, uh, clearing that we committed to earlier on, right? So how are we doing on that? Uh, uh, well, yeah, so, or so we had the Project 100, which was a partnership with Bissell and Homeward Trust, where we were seeing if we could house 100 people from encampments through the summer. Yeah. And uh, Bissell did hit that target. Uh, it was slightly later than uh, than targeted, but um, I think it was towards the beginning of October, they completed the permanent housing of 100 people out of encampments so we, uh, over so, the summer. So we met that target, that's, that's great. So, uh, uh, is there is that target kind of continuing? I know we said housing 100. Now that was done by October. Now we're here in uh, in February. We are still clearing encampments. Navigation centers absolutely uh, 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 producing results and a very good addition, and we appreciate that. So, so are we kind of like how shouldn't be setting more targets of housing people part of this uh, uh, this effort? Yeah, so the goal with the, pilot, the Project 100 was to really focus um, everyone's collective efforts on this mm -hmm. target so that we could identify um, gaps and challenges to that process and then work systematically to target them. And so there was, um, yeah, quite a bit of learnings from, from, the, pro from the project. Uh, I think it's always good to have a goal because that helps to, you know, um, highlight uh, yeah, whether you're expectations yep. or not. Um, so I think I, for sure the housing teams all have monthly goals, um, but I would expect that the sector will do something similar to this again in the future okay. uh, because it's, it's part of the regular continuous improvement processes that yep. um, Homer Trust is And what I in. would suggest, Mayor, is the goal should be the, the people that were, were, are getting to the center for support. So 231 people who, uh, that we have so far, that should be our target. 100% mm -hmm. of the people that get to yep. that navigation center. Uh, that should be the target for people who get every, into housing. Every, so making sure everyone is get get support to permanent long term support for housing, correct? Addiction, the recovery, and all that. Right? Yeah. So you know we we know we've done sixty five referrals out of the two thirty one. So I think I would argue that we need to up the game and yeah. we, that the referrals we need to do more referrals to the. But again, people have a choice. Yeah. We can't force them to be referred. No, you can't. Yeah. Uh, just two EPS. Thank you so much for uh, for your work. Um, did I understand you correctly, or maybe I misunderstood? When you go out there, engagement, engage with encampment residents before they're asked to move. You said you said hope, mustard seed, and radius are there, or 
or did I understand? Uh, did I understand you correctly or not? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, there are help navigators uh, that are at the uh, encampments when they are being uh, disassembled at that time. So, with our help navigators, that is uh, Hope, Mustard Seed, Spady, Bentero, and Radius. Okay. So they're there with EPS. They are there. We're we're essentially behind them, but yes. Okay. I think that's very important information. That is not like I did not know that. I. Uh, I think it's very important information to uh, to communicate that it's uh, that social supports are there when people are being, uh, you know, asked to leave or you know go to a navigation center. That's correct, Mr. Mayor. I mean, this goes right back to when Chief McPhee first arrived on the formation of the uh, Community Safety and Wellbeing Bureau. Our navigators uh, play an integral integral part in the uh, in our bureau. Everything from uh, an encampment issue all the way up to our uh, integrated offender management and our prolific offenders as well. Okay. Uh, they're very, very valuable uh, to our organization. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I will, sorry, I will take the chair back and cons go to Councillor Rutherford. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, I guess just on this conversation, you know, since December and January and, and in reflecting, um, for me, I think about that report in April 2023 where we approved the encampment approach and two key outcomes were discussed in that encampment approach. One, that people experiencing unsheltered homelessness have clear, consistent and rapid connections to supports and housing and encampments do not diminish individual and or public safety. And I really don't know if we hit that mark in December and January. Does administration have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, Councillor, I would say not 100% in the results, but I think um, over the last three or four weeks, we've had better results than prior to that with the, the assistance of the Coordination Centre. But I would say the only way we're going to get 100% there is if is if there is no fire safety in any encampment in town. And we know we had a, an apartment building that was set on fire this past weekend because there was an encampment beside it that and an open fire that hit a gas line. Uh, so that's, that demonstrates that we haven't totally reduced the, the, the safety issue left with encampments. And then I think uh, getting back to the 232 that went to the center, but only 65 referrals. We're, we're not getting as far as we need to get to get people into housing. So not quite there, but better, better results, I would say, recently than before that. Yeah, and I guess what I want to dig into, though, um, Andre, is, you know, when we prove this, you know, it was with this intent and then for this policy direction and then administration goes and, uh, you know, operationalizes the policy. But if the discussion around policy included those things in advance, like in December, we didn't have this navigation center. At the beginning of January, we didn't have this navigation center. So the policy direction and the discussion that happened in April was clear that we would be connecting people to supports and housing in a clear, consistent and rapid fashion. But that didn't happen before the. So I guess I'm just I'm seeing it. That's where I'm really grappling with is a disconnect between what kind of policy direction council gave and how it has been operationalized. And it's great that we have that navigation center. Now I'm fully aware that it's also temporary. And I have a feeling that our unhoused folks will still exist once that navigation center is no longer there. So how do we, how do we address that discrepancy? Does it make sense what I'm kind of asking or what, I, what I my concern is that I'm showing up here? Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense to me, Councillor, because I think, um, the policy direction provided gives us clear direction, but it doesn't give us all the resources to 100% control that. And we have to rely on partners. We have to rely on other orders of government who's other, who, who have different responsibilities and jurisdictions. So I feel that as well, that, you know, um, I, I, we don't have all the resources to achieve the policy directive. So we've tried to do our best with working with partners and doing, you know, standing up things like cot teams and help teams and all those and navigation and all those things. And we've funded things like that, but you're right. Um, it, it's not as, uh, easy. It's not as clear to us how we implement the policy 
because I don't have full control of all the resources that are required to put that policy in place. So yeah. I think it, I, I struggle with that as well. And I think so do our teams. And I do think yeah, it makes a lot I, of sense. And I think that like, had that been something that had been shored up in the discussion in April about we can have this intent, we don't have the capacity to necessarily do this all the time with encampment, um, removing of encampments, it would have been a different conversation with committee, I suspect. Um, I, I would add, like, I'll give an I'll example. Write. I'll give an example to help. You know, I think about the extreme cold. One of the things we were critiqued about is in the extreme cold weather, removing encampments. Yes, we know there's fires, and I've been very clear about, I, from a safety perspective, there's a lot of concern about encampments, and encampments are not ideal. But when we look at removing shelter in an extreme cold, how, what kind of things were we weighing in that from an individual safety perspective? Well, I, I would say what's mostly driving where we're going is wanting to prevent people from getting frostbite and you know mm -hmm. some of the injury, some of the extreme injuries we've seen. Um, so getting them to a warm place first of all, right? Okay, I'm out of time. Thank you so much. I think David, do you want to deliver? Yeah, yeah, if, if, if I may just uh, respond to the, the councillor's comments there around safety, I, I think uh, Jennifer Flamman shared this statistic, and it depends what homeless number you use, whether it's 3,000 or 1,500, but somebody in an encampment is at least 111 times more likely to die in a fire based on last year's fire fatality statistics that we've sadly experienced. Um, so, you know, the vulnerabilities that they face is significantly more than other Edmontonians. So, you know, I can't look any of you in the eye and say, we just can let these things continue when somebody is 111 times more likely to die in a fire than other people. It's just, it's just wrong. And, we, you know, we're trying to do something about it and it's certainly not a perfect outcome, but neither is somebody being 111 times more likely to die in a fire. And, nobody's life is worth any more or any less than anyone else's. So we have to kind of value everyone and try and do something about it. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Council Salvador, can you, uh, sorry, uh, Rutherford, can you move the second round, please? Sure, I'll move a uh, second round on this item. Okay. Second. Is second by Council Salvador, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now we go back to the list. Councillor Salvador, go ahead, please. Sorry, Councillor Nack. Councillor Nack, you're next. Am I? I think so. I, hey, no, Councillor, here you go. I've got a new list now. Councillor okay. Wright, you are next. I thought so, but I was going to wait. Okay. Um, Okay, so on the one slide where it shows the, the 121 um, to shelters, or sorry, from shelters, um, let me look at the slide so I actually know what I'm talking about. Sorry, um, 121 connected to shelter as a result of 231 all-time visitors to the centre. How many were actually at the encampments that maybe didn't go to the centres? Because in that time period, um, it, it appears from the open data portal for 311 cleared encampments that there was 52 encampments cleared in that time period. Do we know how many people were at the encampments? Yeah, sorry, I'm just, um, bear with me for one second. Yeah, so Andre, I think if you want, I can take that. So my, my statistics, the ones I'm looking at, Council, are, are a little bit more current than the slides. So I'm looking at as a um, more recent figures. So of the 191 sites that we've cleaned up in total, there was 271 occupants and 150 went to, um, were transported to the centre. That, that's a more recent statistic that I'm looking and at. And that's over what time period? 
That's in, in the time period since the um, we've been open and the navigation since center's the navigation been open. navigation center open? Okay, so like three, yeah. four weeks or whatever? Okay. Um, yeah, and then there's a higher number that have gone to the navigation center that didn't come from the cabinets that were walk-ins, so. Okay, and that's included in that 231 is not just encampments, but walk-ins and drop-offs? No, the 231 is encampments. There's okay. a higher number that have gone to the navigation center. As of this today, it was up to 292 that had been to the nav center, but that's encampments plus walk-ins. Okay, and these aren't individual unique numbers, right? So a person could have walked in, gotten a referral to housing, gotten basic health care, gotten ID and all that, right? We just can't add those up. But Correct. Yeah. yeah, okay, just wanted to double check that. And then um, Mr. Jones, I had um, tried to get some information and I can see how difficult it would be. Um, as to the number of encampments that were cleared and re-cleared and re-cleared. Um, and going through the, um, um, the open data portal um, to try to get that information, from December 1st to February 7th, um, it looks like there was about 1,827 encampments uh, that were reported to 311, and 177 of them were set for cleanup. So just going by the, de the, um, um, the latitude and longitude of the different um, encampments, one, one that concerns me is in Macaulay, 108th Ave between 96th and 95th Street, there was a total of eight times cleared in that two-month period or just over two-month period. So like, and I know we've, we've fenced off some of them, like the one at the top of Roland Road, but aren't we just, aren't we just kind of throwing good money after bad if we keep spending money to clear the encampment and it just crops up again and we clear it and it crops up again? Well, I, I think part of the strategy that we've had going back before this new um, uh, EOC activation has been to make sure that we don't get uh, large entrenched encampments uh, because we know that as, as soon as that happens, um, they become harder to manage. Uh, there's, uh, you know, criminal element that comes into them, all kinds of other safety issues that compound. Uh, and so by keeping things moving, we actually uh, have avoided uh, some of the ones that historically we've had in the past. Uh, so that's been part of it. Um, and again, you know, we know that there are some areas, uh, especially in the center core, that regardless of how many times we clean them up, it's just access to all the other uh, facilities, services, et cetera, around that makes them, uh, you know, a unique spot uh, that, that tends to attract uh, re-encampment. Okay. Uh, we I, I do just, have... I just want to, just, I just have a few seconds left. Um, you said we want to keep them moving, but, but isn't our goal really to house people? Yes, of course it is. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that we don't want to have large entrenched encampments uh, on account of all of the other risks that are involved. So it's a balancing between, um, you know, uh, the, the risk assessment that we have and connecting people to um, appropriate resources. The Navigation Center is a great uh, op opportunity for us because it allows us to immediately hand people over to, or, you know, if they're willing to go, to have people uh, accessing all the supports that otherwise we're waiting for people to go out to encampments and connect with folks. And, uh, you know, that process takes longer. Okay, my time's up. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Jans. Thank you. I just wanted to get a little clarity here. So it sounds like the risk assessment has sort of been set aside while we proceed in this path. And the, the decisions to go encampments are effectively being decided by either the fire department or the police department. Do I understand that correctly? No, you don't, Councillor. The risk assessment is being followed, absolutely. Um, and then the decisions on which encampments on what day is a joint decision that the city, fire, and police are involved together in. So if, okay, if we're sort of accepting that no encampment is safe, are we prioritizing removal of encampment then based on uh, fire hazard or or what? I'm just trying to get a, a sense of that. or. It's, it's, it's based on the, the comprehensive risk assessment, which has fire as one of the top uh, risks for sure, uh, but it's all in that risk matrix. And so it's all those things put together. 
Okay, because I'm really concerned about our drought conditions, and I'd like to have another conversation about if we're properly looking at fire hazard in the River Valley. So I'm, I appreciate the update there. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, curious about um, the ICC. How many folks are headed to the ICC? Half two. I'll see if EPS want to answer that. Um, yeah, Councilor Jens, uh, the answer or the number is zero. Oh, could you? Sorry, could you clarify? Maybe I'm misunderstanding. So they go to the support center, they get medical attention there from Radius. Is that correct? Well, uh, the ICC is is an option, uh, but where we're at right now is is that uh, either is that they are going to the navigation center themselves. The ICC, prior to the expedited uh, closure of the encampments is where uh, we would take uh, folks that were, say, severely intoxicated, uh, that we would uh, arrest them for, uh, you know, we call it a 115-2. So where they go, rather than being taken to our detention management unit up in Northwest, we bring them to our old cells downstairs in order for them. And once they're stabilized, as if they are, uh, they are uh, released, and then they are met by uh, two radius health uh, navigators. So they would have a conversation at that time. And then uh, again, the conversation is trying to get them to utilize uh, services voluntarily. Okay, so you could still go to the ICC if you were picked up for a 115.2 on say 118 Ave or something like that, but you wouldn't end up most definitely, and as a matter of fact, that's what we would, uh, we almost want to prioritize uh, that location uh, versus the uh, detention management units uh, up in Northwest. Uh, because we're finding that it's just more beneficial uh, uh, for uh, in order to access those services uh, once they're released. Okay, um, that that's helpful. Um, so I just want to go back to transit again. What are what are we hearing from ATU or from? Because just talking to drivers and talking to others, it does seem like things have gotten a lot worse in the in the last month or so. Um, I'm, I'm again, this may be my anecdote, but I would really appreciate some data about how many people we're, we're, we're dealing with. I mean, I, I just saw at the University Transit Center and others, I don't want to name names, but um, it does seem like there's a lot more desperation around. I'm not sure if, do we have any stats or even the number of riders on the bus I've seen? For sure, uh, Councillor. So I met with inspectors on Friday and did a walkabout, and I've heard from riders, and I chatted with Steve from ATU this morning. Definitely seeing an increase. While I appreciate David saying at lockup it's improved, that's great, but we're seeing a lot in the morning and throughout the day, and I'm also seeing more reports of suspected overdose activity, uh, and we're seeing a lot of people who are sleeping uh, on our trains and sleeping in the stations as well, making it difficult for riders to navigate. So we've definitely, uh, through those conversations, have seen an increase, but I can talk to the team about seeing if we can pull some numbers in a way that can be shared with council in the next safety update. I guess my ask is, is it possible to expand the navigation center intake to not just the encampments, but the other folks who are sort of, I'll call them encampment displaced that we're seeing more and more around other Southside, Southgate, other locations. Yeah, I can I can jump in on that. Certainly, we have uh, protocols now put in place just recently, uh, where our peace officers, if they're in transit spaces, our COT teams, etc., can access the navigation center even if people aren't in an encampment. So that that net is widening for the services that are being offered by the navigation center. Uh, and I'm assuming um, that probably the same is true of the EPS, that they're having uh, folks referred to uh, that space um, who aren't coming directly from the encampment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much. So we just want to pick up uh, for my last line of questioning. Um, with with EPS, I think you mentioned sort of individual tents not not being considered in encampments. Can I just get some clarity around that? Well, yeah, the, I guess it's you know very safe to say that you know, we don't roll up on every every tent. Um, uh, the main our main focus right now is is the is the entrenched encampments. And again, uh, as I stated earlier, is just that coordinated coordinated response uh, to. Uh, 
to uh, dismantle uh, dismantle the tents and then getting the services that the, that the folks require. Um, okay, so that that's a good a good clarification point. So so I hear that um, that folks, you know, if there is a tent that that comes up, that that would still go through the risk assessment process. Yes, that's correct. Great. Okay. Yeah. And that, yep. And then, um, I may, maybe if it's helpful, Councillor. One difference is in the past, or system, you, you know, we get uh, if we if we dismantled an encampment, and we came back the next day, or some people came back, that would start a whole risk assessment process. What is different in our assessment now is that if we clear encampment on one day, we come back the next day. To make sure it's not getting retrenched again, we don't have to put it all right back into the whole risk assessment again. It's, it's some of the practices we've been doing that in just a couple of small places. Yeah. What what would the geography of that look like? Sorry, like. Well, for example, the encampment that's right in front of Bissell, like it's you know if it's cleared on say a, a Tuesday, and then there are four people starting to retrench on the Wednesday, we'll try to go back there and say, we cleared this yesterday and we need, we, you know, and we offer them the same sort of supports and stuff like that. Okay. And I guess that being a really operative question is that any time, um, you know, regardless if it's two days after, if it's, the, you know, the initial time, there are always going to be those supports, those navigation supports on hand? Correct. And the ability to get to the navigation center and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I... I am not very comfortable with some of the, the shifts in practice in terms of uh, the lack of notice, um, just the, the approach to extreme temperature, and again, recognizing the, the complexities. I don't know, you know, a really effective way forward in terms of governance, providing that, that level of detail, but I was thinking at a broad, that maybe an appropriate way forward would just be direction around engaging with social, social service agencies to provide lived experience input, human-centered, uh, trauma-informed adjustments to those practices? Is that that direction that we could provide? Well, I'd say we've done a lot of that already and we're always willing to listen, but if, if you want us to do that again, we, we could, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think just those two practices in terms of, you know, recognizing that, that notice periods can be can be short but what I'm hearing is that there isn't any notice period being provided granted there may be staff that that provide time but people don't have an option to to vacate or, or move without there being presence um, and I think I think just in terms of the extreme temperature again there's I think there's some important perspectives that I don't know are are being incorporated into the policy the question being though if we do provide that direction to have that engagement would you be open to adjustments in those those aspects? Well, we'll follow the will and the direction of council. Um, I, I I I don't want people to get frostbite encampments in encampments, and I think. Um, but if if council directs us to do something there, we'll we'll follow it. I I can't speak for. I think it also depends though on our other partners because I you can. We're not the initial contact, so I think you'd also have to have a discussion with um, the commission about those things. But well, and, uh, and you know what I hear yeah. consistently from EPS is that they follow our risk assessment. Um, so again, I think if we have policies and procedures in place there, I, I would just caution that I think um, allowing more people to stay in encampments during cold weather is, is in my opinion, going to result in more death and more. Uh, severe cold weather injuries as opposed to getting those place into a warm place getting those people mm -hmm. into a warm place like the reception center where they can at least be warm they may not get directly to housing but they won't freeze to death there, so. yeah absolutely and I think the navigation center you know adds a different dimension um, I think that I think that the the voices of those that are experiencing this also also has weight in terms of what uh, what they want to see in those situations. So happy to come around for a few more Thank questions. You. Thank you. Councilor Stevenson, Councilor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so yeah, just to to loop back to some of the questions around um, the risk assessment, I appreciate the answers around um, high risk situations, but uh, also need some clarity around um, the process and, and the approach we're taking uh, if they're assessed as low risk.
Go ahead, Troy. I'm happy to answer that. So the process remains the same. Uh, we look at a housing focused response with connection to our partnering agencies to try and assist those people uh, to get into housing in an expedited fashion. And so how does that, how does that interact with the navigation center now for, for low risk encampments? Well, like we're are doing... those individuals, um, like even for low risk, are we, is there a process in place that essentially uh, dismantles that camp at that time? Or is it a, a longer process? Well, it depends on the circumstance. If it's within an area where we have high activity, and obviously one of the biggest challenges we have is with recidivism. We know that people are willing to wait us out, go across the street from a site closure, then reoccupy it within a very per short period of time. So we're trying to focus on those sites and get them closed as quickly as possible, regardless if they're high risk or low risk. One of the things we factor though in our risk assessment is the amount of site occupations, which actually encourages to be within that high risk setting. If it's low risk, then we will consider housing focus, but depending on the factors that we're seeing, we're seeing we're still seeing a lot of high risk sites. Okay. Um, okay, I might have more. Um, just on the referrals to housing. Sorry, um, recognizing we don't have full data and there's a bit of a gap there when it comes to folks actually staying in housing. Um, do we have data around referrals to like VOPD um, or, or anything like that? And, and some of the other programs that uh, we might be seeing referrals to, but uh, do we know how many folks are actually being seen in those programs um, and what that follow through looks like? Yeah, I think that's one of the big data gaps, uh, Councillor Salvador, that we need to work with our partners on. Again, w again, we don't control the data here, so I, I think we have to work with some of our partners on uh, how that data is shared, and, and that's a, a gap for us. But Crystal, I don't know if you want to add anything on that. Uh, I would just to maybe I could clarify some of the housing referrals and how that's and how that's probably working so that it's helpful. But so it says that they refer to housing teams. That's, that would be a housing first team that's funded by Homer Trust. And just to be clear, Home, Hope Mission has a housing first team that is funded by Homer Trust. So I suspect if someone isn't connected to a housing team already and they're being referred to housing, it's being referred to Hope Mission's team. So we can reach out to them and connect with them in terms of um, some of those follow through pieces. Some other folks that come in the door might already be connected to a housing team and so they would be um you know re-referred or reconnected to that team at another agency whoever that may be if that makes sense so some of it is um is really we do this all the time on the encampment side of things but we have to really reach out to those specific teams to track the progress towards that and it would be similar for vopd you can track referrals which is the time that you've warmly handed somebody off to that or connected them to that service provider. But in terms of follow through, that's a systematic piece that needs to be tracked. And it's not just a data gap in Edmonton, that's a province wide data gap that the provincial government is working on trying to close with the development of some digital tools um, like My Alberta Health ID and, and some of the uh, addiction treatment service pieces related to that. Okay, that's, that's helpful. Yeah, because I mean, um, referrals are great, but obviously, like this is such a, such a, a key uh, data gap that, that we'll be able to speak to the efficacy of this entire entire model and this entire process. So um, we'll look forward to, to any additional work on that front. Um, yeah, really quickly, just uh, questions about just, I guess, the sustainability of the Navigation Centre. So hearing that, you know, peace officers on transit are accessing the Navigation Centre, uh, referrals are kind of coming in from uh, multiple directions and angles beyond just encampments. Um, yeah, like I, I hear that there might be a desire to continue on uh, the operations of the center. Um, would that be like who would be leading that? What would expectations be around cost funding? Yeah, Councillor, I, I, I'm taking the lead on that, and my intent is to have conversations with the province about how long they could extend it. Could it become a permanent fixture? Those kind of questions. So I'm uh, I'm doing that myself, uh, and we'll continue to let you know if I have any progress on that. Okay, I'm out of time. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Uh, Councillor Rice, can you take the chair, please? Yes, sure, he's taken. Thank you. So I would like to better understand, Andre, I know we don't have the data yet, and uh, you know, and Navigation Center is, uh, is absolutely producing promising uh, uh, results so far, looking at the how many people are using uh, and accessing services. What I would like to understand that 231 
people that were connected to our navigation center. I'm looking at the data that was presented in the in the slide. Uh, I, how many of them are actually staying out of houselessness? I hope that they're not falling back into houselessness. Right? I think that's very important for us to understand in order to for this to be effective. Because having ID is a great idea. But a week later, two weeks later, that person is again falling back into a, into the cycle of houselessness. That is not great, right? So I think understanding that is very, very important uh, for us to kind of monitor the long-term success of this. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, uh, Mayor Sohi. And it's it's a it's still a gap for us, and yeah. we have to find better ways of following through with the data. The problem is we lose control of the data when other really good partners start to contribute and support, and yeah. so. It, I, I don't think it's a, a lack of, well, I think it's a lack of coordination overall with the data. I don't think it's a lack of desire to share data, but we've got to, we've got to absolutely bust through that and sort that out so we can know for sure. Because yeah. this that's app what, always been an issue, right? Yeah. And, and again, even if somebody gets into housing first today and is there for yeah. a year, yeah. Yeah. we can't seem to track when they fall out of it a year and a half, two years later as well. And, and uh, you know, there's lots of issues with privacy and all that stuff, but yeah. it, it's, a, it's a huge problem for us because it's so hard for us to follow things. Yeah, because a lot of people are putting a lot of good work into this from fire, from EPS, social workers, province, your folks, and uh, us advocating and all that, right? So we want this to be successful for an assistant permanent way, right? So that's why it's important. I would also like to better understand, maybe this is a question to EPS. The 48% of the um, encampment occupants, where are they going? Like 52% go to the navigation center. Where are the rest going? Do we know? Do we have any sense? No. We hear from ETS, some might be going to the transit centers and, uh, and riding around LRT stations and all that, but do we have a sense from uh, from your perspective where where those people are going? Uh, I do not care. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think it, it, it's important to note that with that forty eight percent, we're not compelling people to go to the navigation center. Yeah. Like we're arresting them, they we're not forcing them. So they do have some individual agency as to where that they, they where they do choose to go. What we've seen in terms of, uh, and I think there's been a subtext about displacement of individuals and seeing them in the LRT, seeing them in um, other side, other neighborhoods within the city. Um, this has been something that has been taking place before the navigation center, probably through some of the high-risk encampment team work. But what we've seen, and I think you've gotten a presentation about this, is this displacement is also from uh, gangs. And it's also from the gangs that, um, as you've heard us speak about it, there's been academic uh, research done interviewing folks who are houseless within Edmonton, houseless in the downtown, and those who use drugs, and speaking about their migration patterns. And they've been leaving the downtown due to the lack of safety within um, uh, the, the particular area. So mm -hmm. when we're having, and we actually do connect with those folks, with our social navigators and our partners from different agency and to get them to the navigation center, we're really trying to propel those people who are willing and able and ready in that moment to connect there. We still do have to fill that gap of the other 48% in terms of tracking them and hopefully coming into contact with them again. But our priority is now that we have folks who are wanting these services, ensuring that we can get them to that center right away. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point because I think there were some uh, articles published based on conversation with the people who were camping in more suburban community that were actually leaving downtown congested areas for their own safety as well, right? Because they wanted to be away from uh, congregate places and criminal activity. That's what you're referring to? Uh, this is to EPS. Like, I, I don't know who is answering my question because I see, can't see you, right? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, that is what I was referring to, that, that research there, getting the perspective of those who were living uh, rough or being, uh, were houseless within downtown and moving because of fear of um, uh, the, the predators within um, some of the these areas. Yeah, got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will move the second round. Third round, sorry. Second. Another additional round. I'll move the additional round. Second to the third. Mm -hmm. 
we have all the votes. We have all the votes. Okay, I will take the chair back. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. Um, so just, just following up, so in terms of that feedback from social service agencies, uh, Mr. Corbold, I think you did mention there was gonna be a third meeting with those agencies. There's gonna be a third mayor's meeting. We can, we'll continue to meet with them as, as we work with them and do more. So I just want to, there's one more mayor's chaired meeting. Gotcha. There are gonna be multiple other meetings all the time that we have with folks, yeah. Okay, so I'm just wondering what, how you may want to move forward at this point. So recognizing that, that those lines of communication are ongoing, um, is it possible to put those two specific questions to those agencies and then respond, you know, adapt accordingly? Or again, do you need me to make an explicit motion? No, we can put to, those questions yeah? to the okay. to the agency. So the specific one is notice, and the other one is the the, the yeah. temperature. We we can. We, I think we've had that conversation, but we can we can specifically ask again. And I don't think I need a motion to do it. Perfect. Yeah. I appreciate that. And yeah. again, I, I you know I want to be clear. I, I really recognize the work that's been done and and is being done. And I think it is um, you know just constantly calibrating this to be to be as human centered as possible and, and yeah. supporting people in, in ho experiencing homelessness um, and and on that note too so you know i i'm certainly seeing uh, more folks kind of still sleeping out so just sort of in in sleeping bags under blankets under tarps um, are we able to continue outreach efforts for them and again connect them with the navigation center yeah, absolutely, and I think uh, the EPS do this with their help teams as well, so I, you know, certainly. Um, and if we can get the navigation center to be more permanent in, in mm -hmm. nature, then I think we could, you know, eventually maybe we'll be in a position where most of the, most of the uh, navigation to the navigation center is not coming from encampments, but coming from other places. So, absolutely. I, you know, the bottom line is the the navigation center has not refused anybody who comes forward and presents themselves. And I'll just see if EPS want to add. If that's okay. Please, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, from the EPS perspective, we've also I increased, uh, I guess, uh, the capacity within our organization to be referring to the navigation center. So whether it be patrol, our beats, our help teams, when we are finding folks that we believe that would be good candidates, we wanna make sure that they have that offer. So it's not just going to be any high risk encampment team that is going to be the only avenue or pathway for an individual to come to that navigation center. We're ensuring that um, if our patrol members do see someone, whether they would be sleeping rough or um, they do come across someone that would be best served by getting access to those services, that they are uh, promptly referred and the navigation center is uh, set up and structured for that. Great, thank you so much. Just gonna try to wrap up in my last two minutes, but appreciate hearing that. Um, and, and on that, you know, I'm, I you know, was really pleased to have a chance to, to visit the navigation center. Wondering if there's opportunities to get some of the other other agencies and mutual aid organizations into the navigation center just so they have full information and can also help help spread the word? Yeah, well, certainly some of them are part of the operation, but yeah, we, I'm sure we can uh, help um, orchestrate that. We obviously wanna not disrupt it, but we can, I'm sure we can find ways of doing that. Great, well, and I appreciate the comments earlier about strengthening some of the data collection. I think, you know, we've sort of set up this system through coordinated access and just ensuring that we're, we're using that as much as possible with the navigation center. Um, this is actually Mayor Sohi's idea. I have to give him credit from our tour, but um, would it be possible to have city presence at the navigation center recognizing we can provide some of the low income transit passes, uh, leisure access program, has that been contemplated? Uh, I don't know, but we can look into that and we'll take that away. I, I don't see why not if we can't, if there's things that are required there that we can provide, absolutely. Great. And then just wondering in terms of the shelter capacity, um, wondering if we're still getting sort of regular updates on those statistics and also if there's a breakdown of capacity by site, just so we can see some of those trends in terms of, you know, where where people are choosing to, to go to when they have different shelter options. Uh, we can certainly ask for that information from the province, yeah. Great, I think, I think again, there's, there's, um, 
data is always a hard thing to collect, but I think it really helps to inform our response and, and share, you know, demonstrate what interventions are the most helpful. I think that's it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Jans. Thank you. So I just want to be clear on this for when we meet with the Premier or government next. So I'm looking at page nine. So uh, right now we're batting 52% or so in terms of getting people into a pathway to care. And we want to increase that. The three gaps identified were the youth, the diversity of intake process, aka bring people in from the trains or other, other means, stations, and then working better with some of the other partners in there. I guess I'm wondering um, what other asks do we have? I think I heard something like we still aren't at the 1700 beds. We need to close that gap. There's a couple hundred there. Uh, this has got to be taxing on police resources, I'm sure. Fire, I'm sure, is getting anxious about the summer drought season, the spring drought. But what are the other asks that council should be taking forward to the Premier? Anyone can answer. Um, I think we should probably take that, I mean, with respect to this encampments, Councillor, or because we have, you know. In general, I guess in general, like I'm wondering... Because uh, I've, I've heard there's still, I think I heard today, there was a three or four week wait time for housing. So even if we get somebody into the NAV center to match them with an actual bedroom, it's still three weeks. Is that right? Or is it six weeks? Yeah, so typical housing processes can take 59 days from the point of getting accepted onto housing first team. And part of that is just due to um, staff like the capacity of those teams and also as well um, the ability of market of, of that within the right price bracket that can be afforded by the housing first teams. I think, Councillor, the best thing for us to do is take that request and, and sort of do some work on it, and, and we can advise Council what, what the priority... I don't want to just answer that in the moment. I think we need to clarify some priorities and, and get back to you with what that ask should look like. Yeah, I would I would like to have a better understanding as well about the risk assessment conversation. Like I, I, again, for the third time, I'm very nervous about the drought in the spring in the River Valley and that we're sitting on a giant tinderbox here. And uh, I know other councillors have flagged this as well too. So um, maybe we need to, no, I see. Uh, well, you may all, I'll, I'll just start with that. I did speak with the fire chief last week on this. And uh, of course we were starting to go through, go down that road of conversation when we were in our emergency management meeting. And uh, I know the fire chief is um, taking different perspectives on the risk. We're looking at different options for how we might mitigate the risk given the increased uh, fire um, threat that we're, we're facing because of the drought, including, you know, like, you know, maybe we need some of our own sort of wildfire-like resources that we need to have on standby. So I know the fire chief is putting a plan together. I'm not going to ask uh, Deputy Fe Fire Chief Lesenby to lay that out because we don't have it yet, but we're working on uh, special mitigation and contingencies for this summer, given the risk. Love it. Um, yeah, okay, well, well. yeah, I really appreciate the presentation. This was very, very helpful, and, and thank you for uh, thank you for sharing this. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Wright. Thank you. So um, the Navigation Centre takes walk-ins, right? So should Bissell and Boyle and other agencies then just referring be referring individuals to there for the faster service, quicker ID, better access to housing? I, I mean, yes, I, yeah, they, they can, but if they're if they can do those things as well, I think that's good as well. Well, uh, the ID takes four to six weeks through the application process that Bissell and Boyle have to undergo, but they can get it within a week from the from the navigation center. And if that's what, what they need to get connected to financial supports and housing and that. And then I'm just also wondering then how do we direct, how do they, how do people get there? Because it is kind of away from the, sort of the central services. Um, yeah, just, somebody. yeah, from EPS uh, counselor, yeah, we, we would encourage uh, Bissell and Boyle uh, to give referrals to the navigation center and to provide transportation to the navigation center. Um, if there's any assistance in the meantime, we can work through that. I don't uh, think Bissell and Boyle have their own transportation services. I know Hope Mission's got them. Mm -hmm. Is there any others? Does Boyle have? Okay. okay I, I think we can work with them, Councillor. I mean, we can, that's a, 
a question that we could take to Bissell or Boyle and talk to them how about, you know, do they, do they want to do that? Can we help? Because again, we're providing some of the transportation to the navigation center through contracted services through the EPS. Maybe we can find a way to, to drop by them. So we'll have that chat with them and find out um, if that's what they want. The other thing I think is worth doing is, is you know, can we find a way of getting the more speedy ID? How can we help Bissell and Boyle get some of those things done oh, faster I, on site? I, I think that's the ideal answer, but they've been trying for years to, well, to get first that. I've, so first I've heard yeah. of it, so we Kay. can look into that as well. Okay, yeah. awesome. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thanks. I, I know that, sorry, last summer when we had our, our shelter at Jasper Place Wellness Centre, or sorry, last winter, uh, they had done a, some great work with one of the local registry agents where they were sort of fast-tracking ID. So I'm sure there's ways we can help Bissell and Boyle do that, and we'll, we'll get on top of that. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So that concludes the questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, to uh, the entire delegation from FIRE, from EPS, and City for being part of this conversation and the work you are leading. So thank you so much. So that concludes the questions now. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. I don't know if anyone wants to speak. Uh, if not, oh, Councillor Stevenson, go ahead, please. Huh? Yeah, quickly, you know, if you want, we can finish the agenda. Thank you. Uh, no, I really appreciate the conversation today. And, um, you know, there there is a lot to be uh, encouraged by. Um, you know, the opening of the Navigation Centre, I, I truly think is is uh, a game changer in many ways and certainly a really, really important piece of the puzzle that, that we've been missing up until now. Um, I'm really, really grateful for the efforts that have been made and, you know, the, the deep commitment that the staff and the team there have in terms of removing barriers. It was incredibly heartening to hear the work they did to accommodate pets, uh, to accommodate um, individuals who, uh, you know, need need a bit of time before they're able to access detox or, or other housing options. It's it's a great model, and I hope it can continue to be refined and um, uh, and improved even further. But it, it's a great starting point and something that that is encouraging. I. I, we also had a chance today to talk about a lot of the tensions that I think continue to exist in our encampment response and ones that, that I feel. Um, you know, again, I think, I think all parties are approaching this work, um, you know, very intentionally and, and again with the, the desire to support and, and help individuals. So I was really pleased to hear the confirmation that no individual tents or encampments are being removed without first going through the risk matrix assessment. That's that's a really critical uh, piece. Um, and I did also hear though that, that residents aren't receiving any notice before being removed and that uh, we plan to continue removing structures um, in extreme weather, even if people are not w wishing to access some of the services on offer. So, I, I truly understand those approaches. Um, I, I know that there is no, no perfect answer, no, no right answer, um, but I'm reflecting a lot on, or the reason I think this is important is that the choices we make in those moments uh, impact individuals' own journeys and the likelihood of them exiting homelessness. Um, the degree to which we can provide a human-centered and trauma-informed response when when encampments are being removed, I think, is really critical to the the long-term success not only of our efforts but for in those individuals' lives. I do think that those with lived experience and and uh, you know organizations that work closely with those populations have really valuable insights that we can learn from um, and continue to, to tweak and, and improve our processes. Um, again, very encouraged um, by some of the shifts we're seeing, very encouraged by the, the diversity of shelter spaces that are being brought on. Um, again, not, not the long-term fix, but a critical, critical element in the short term as we work to build out our, our housing capacity. Um, and, and housing on the full spectrum, uh, treatment, supportive housing, affordable housing. 
Um, so thank you to all of the partners who were involved um, and to all the city staff who are, who are helping with this work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. And uh, before I go to Councillor uh, Wright, quickly also want to uh, convey my appreciation to, uh, to everyone who has been part of this, uh, this work from our city staff to uh, fire rescue and EPS, social workers, people from Hope, Mustard, Radius, and others, right? So uh, Hope Mission and uh, Boyle, you know, the people that are living on our streets, living in encampments, are not there by choice. They're driven into those situations by the circumstances that society has created uh, that pushed them into, uh, into houselessness because of the ongoing uh, not investing enough in uh, helping people deal with their intergenerational trauma or uh, uh, many other issues that people do face because uh, those are the reason that people get in uh, are pushed into uh, in, into this situ in these these situations. Uh, uh, I am optimistic about the results that we have seen and the numbers we have seen out of. Uh, Navigation Center. So I want to thank Province as well for uh, set, setting it up and listening to the concerns of Edmontonians and responding to those and stepping up, which is absolutely something that we need to appreciate and uh, uh, and 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 acknowledge and do acknowledge and and appreciate. Uh, uh, yes, there are gaps. I hope that next conversation that we will have with social agencies, uh, you know, will have that conversation around involvement of the social agencies in uh, in the risk metrics that we have developed in order to determine with, uh, uh, which encampments are high risk uh, uh, and so look forward to uh, to that conversation uh, I hope that uh, as we gather more data all those people who are going to the navigation center are accessing services that help them get back into into housing on a long-term sustainable way. But we also know that there are gaps. There are gaps in treatment facilities, there are gap meds, gaps in detox facilities, the amount of time people have to wait uh, once they leave detox to uh, get into, uh, uh, in, into housing and they fall back into the circumstance, their own, those difficult circumstances. Again, we also know there's, you know, we need close to, I think, 1,500 additional supportive housing units that, uh, in order to properly house people. So there are a lot of gaps, but I think this is a, this is a promising uh, uh, step there that are being being taken and uh, and appreciate the work being done. And uh, you know, I think we also need to continue to engage and listen from people with the lived experiences, uh, what their stories are, and be informed by their stories as uh, as we develop our our policies, right? So very complicated work, but uh, this is something that uh, this council is committed to. I'm glad that uh, we are seeing uh, some of the positive results and let's work together to uh, make those results more sustained and permanent. So with that, I'll go to Councillor uh, Nack to, uh, yeah, to speak, sorry. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Mayor Sophie. Yeah, and I, sorry, I, I clicked on after you started. Um, I, I, I just, well, I should chime in a little bit. It's, it's, uh, I realize I've been fairly publicly uh, vocal about uh, this. And, and so um, with what I've heard today, with, with some of the information presided in the presentation, recognizing that we still have a bit of a, a data shortfall at the moment, and that's, uh, that's only because this is you know, four weeks old, not, not because of any uh, unwillingness to share. Um, I, I'm encouraged, you know, I, I, I think this is the, it seems like if these numbers will sort of hold firm and, and sort of uh, follow through with, with when we get more detailed data, um, I think this is gonna be a better interim solution. And I, and I do specifically use that word because I, I think there's no um, hiding the fact that, that, you know, we, the permanent solution is getting into recovery bed, getting into 24 seven supportive housing, something where uh, you'll have that long-term piece, but but in this very challenging scenario, and, and Councillor Stevenson, I think did a great job of summarizing. Like that, neither of these solutions, none of these solutions are perfect because um, if you leave folks specifically in encampments to be there for long times, we've heard about the risk and the harm that can happen there. 
uh, we know there can be harm in displacing folks, uh, but but is this a better, uh, a, a least or a, a less harmful version of, of a short-term solution? Um, you know, I also appreciate what I heard from Ms. Halt McDonald, though, is that, you know, are, is this simply shifting things to other areas? We're, we're doing a lot of work around transit safety and security. Um, and wanting to make sure people feel comfortable using the system. And, and the last thing we want is to, to just move folks from one area of the city to another. Um, and that's something I have been hearing a bit over the last week and a half, just out, out and about in the ward um, with, with an increase of, of you know, single tents uh, being set up throughout. So I appreciate that there's still a, like the reception center isn't gonna solve it all, but I think it, it actually has the opportunity to provide a little more good um, than, than what had been happening. Uh, lots of work, and I know we'll get back to that report item right away around how to address the permanent piece, but, but I, I hope what, I, what my main message would be is I hope that the seemingly success of this, it came together in a very short amount of time. I think we heard the, the Minister Nixon talk about, I think it was November 19th or 29th or something that they started up their cabinet committee and they went forward on this um and, and that's good if uh, it took it very seriously and and wanted to to take immediate action i uh, i hope tying this into the, the the item we will return to that we will see that level of or uh, that pace of action on what is needed for actual permanent solutions because in the end if more folks are back in the transit center, if we're seeing a lot of individual tents set up, that might still produce overall better safety than, than the status quo, um, but that's still not actually getting us to where we need to be. So hopefully we can we can move forward on that. But uh, I, I just wanted to say that from what I'm hearing so far and from, from all the information presented uh, and appreciate that there's more data to come, I'm, I'm hopeful this can be the start of a better interim solution while we work on the long-term. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Now, Councilor, right to close. Thank you very much. Um, I know, so this was for information on encampment, and I think we seem to focus on the navigation center, but I just also want to say that there's so many other partners that are involved um, with helping to, to respond to our um, encampment and, 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 quite frankly, housing emergency. Um, one thing that I didn't mention and I forgot to ask about was the accessibility of the uh, navigation center. Currently, it is not uh, wheelchair or, or walker accessible accessible inside. Um, and I know that is something that was brought up when we did the tour and um, they've, I think, committed to, uh, to addressing that to make it more accessible for, for all individuals. Um, I think it's a good opportunity that they the province now maybe will have exposure to some of the challenges that the social services uh, agencies in our community um, have been faced with. Um, things like, you know, we do need more housing and, um, you know, it's great to have them come into the navigation centre, but we need to provide the solutions to them to, to get them um, on their way to, to finding safe housing. Um, I also hope that the, the mental health supports that people are receiving go beyond the, the addiction recovery model. Um, and I think there was some, some stats in here that people were um, also being addressed or being referred to, to mental health supports. Um, so I'm encouraged by that. Um, thank you very much to administration for the work that you've been doing um, with, with the encampment response and taking into consideration some of the things that we've asked to um, be looked at some more, like like the data and that. And um, so, with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So, on the bylaws that I exempted, 6 .4, sorry, 4.4 and 4.5, I got the answers, uh, the clarification I needed uh, from administration already, right? So I don't need to, uh, I don't have more questions on that. Does anyone else have any questions? If not, we can bring it forward and pass it. For, oh, for, 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 for vote? Yeah, we need to bring it forward, right? Yes. Can someone move that we bring forward 4.4? I move. 
Thank you. Second. Uh, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councilor Cartmel, you want to move those? Uh, four, five, four, 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 five. Uh, yep, Mayor Sohi, I can do that. I will move first reading of items 4.4 .4 and 4.5. Thank you. I can second. Uh, Councilor Salvador seconded. Uh, Councilor Rice? Okay. <laughs> Hard to yeah. see. Okay, Councilor Rice seconded. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Sohi, I'll move second reading of items 4.4 .4 and 4.5. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move consideration of third reading of items three, 4.4 .4 and 4.5. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20741 and bylaw 20742. Second. Thank you, Constance. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you, Councilor Cartmel, Councilor Rice. We'll be back at 345 with uh, our item 3.3.
Good afternoon. We are live from Council Chambers. All right, we are back. Would like to call this meeting back to order. Do a roll call of council colleagues. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cardinal. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. All right, we're back on 3.3. .3. And Councillor Salvador, you're next to ask questions. Great, uh, thank you so much. So yeah, I just wanted to, to loop back to some of the items under the direct investments um, opportunity. And um, yeah, I picked up the one on the one around developing a thousand units on the spectrum of housing solutions, uh, each in Blatchford and exhibition lands. Uh, I guess that one is very exciting to me, um, but just to, to clarify, I mean, would that be sort of above and beyond the 16% affordable housing target that we already have established there? Just curious what the thinking was there. Um, Cause I think there's a lot of potential. I could speak to, uh, to that councillor Salvador. I think, uh, so the 16% target is, it's like an aspirational target. Um, and so while we're trying to work towards accomplishing that, obviously in terms of the financial support piece, that still needs to be determined to ensure that there's sufficient resources to get to the 1,000 units, if that makes sense. And so we are working really closely with the Blatchford team, um, just because it's a bit further ahead from a development perspective to see where there are opportunities for affordable housing. But this, I think, action on the list would just um, imply like a scaling up a, in terms of ambition and aggressiveness from a timeline perspective. Okay. Okay, great. That's, um, that's excellent to hear. And then also had a question about um, under, under expedite city efforts uh, around the opportunity for administration to single source providers of affordable housing um, on city lands. So just as opposed to, you know, having to go through a tender process submissions, what is the current limitation to doing that? Or is there, I guess, what would need to be changed in order to open that door? Um, I think, I, th I think, well, it's not impossible to do that now. Um, we're always trying to balance the need for, uh, you know, transparency and competitiveness uh, with urgency and aggressiveness. And so right now, maybe our process is more weighted towards a transparency piece, which can add additional and competitiveness piece, which can add additional time lines to um, to the practice. And sometimes we also offer sites that aren't a good fit, um, you know, and or with the with the, at, the, at that time. So I think it would be implying a greater degree of flexibility over how we structure things currently, which is primarily to focus on an open R, like an RFP or a request for proposals um, on most of the sites or request for expressions of interest, I should say, on most of the sites. So it would be maybe shifting a bit more towards the um, urgent, aggressive tilt of that spectrum. Okay. <laughs> that makes uh, a lot of sense and totally respect um, the need for, for transparency and sort of um, how we've typically leaned a little bit further in that direction, but I, I think this is a lever that would be um, really exciting to push on uh, for folks who are, and providers who are just ready to go um, immediately if we're uh, intending to move with some urgency here. Great. Um, and then I think the last one I wanted to ask about, I, I think it sort of crosses over both on the expediting city efforts, but uh, red tape reduction and reducing costs for providers. I'm thinking about um like kind of a catalog of pre-approved designs i i think that's a fascinating idea i know other jurisdictions have uh have played with that have we ever done anything in that realm i'm thinking like even basement suites garden suites or would this be kind of a new direction that would be exploring Um, so I can't speak for the full suite, um, spectrum of um, market options out there, but certainly on the non-market side, it's, it's something that was done previously, um, like decades ago, but it's not something that's been really done in a big way in recent years. And you're right to say that um, the, federal, the federal housing minister has expressed an interest in looking at this. And so this would be piggy, piggybacking on those efforts, knowing that obviously any kind of, um, you know, over, um, singular design would need to be contextual or contextualized mm -hmm. to the 
that's being implemented in, right? So we'd be look, maybe trying to get ahead of that a little bit and looking at what could be done um, from a, to help support our nonprofit sector with development uh, capacity and design from that perspective. Totally. Okay. That's great. And I, yeah, I'm kind of of two minds. I'm both very excited about the prospect of having sort of off the shelf pre-approved designs, but um, given past work that I've done, I know sometimes it can actually create an additional barrier if you have pre-approved designs because site context matters so much. And then you end up going through even more regulatory red tape to change those. Um, so yeah, very open-minded there. Um, I think just going back to the bridge healing concept, that as a model is sort of a 12 unit replicable um, almost pre-approved model maybe could make sense given that it's feasible on um, sort of a 33 wide, 50 wide uh, in, in the vast majority of neighborhoods in Edmonton. Uh, but yeah, I'll leave that up there. Uh, and then just really quickly, really excited about opportunities for um, supporting folks who are exiting federal correctional institutions, recognize that's mostly on the feds, but if there's anything we can do in that regard, I think that is a major, major barrier right now. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, I think Councillor Nack haven't had a, oh, sure. uh, any rounds on this. Right, Councillor Nack? I have had one round, so oh, I don't ahead. know a round. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Uh, well, yeah, uh, thank you, um, uh, Mayor Sohi. So on the supporting individuals pending the transition away from encampments, uh, one question that, or one, one idea that had come forward to me and, and potentially a couple of us uh, was the idea of some type of, call it a um, housing ombudsman, but appreciating we actually can't do an omb ombudsman, uh, that we don't have that authority. Uh, so sort of like an advocate, somebody that can be a point of contact for people who are experiencing houselessness, who are accessing services and supports, but maybe feel like there have been challenges or mistreatment or, or things like that. And, and I, you know, I, I struggle with, because shelter operations, provincial jurisdiction, these types of things, they have this a center. Um, but at the same time, if, if, if we are still concerned about making sure more and more people are accessing various supports and for any number of reasons they're not, we don't have as good of data as, have we, has that has there ever been a conversation about an idea like that? Yeah, Kelter, maybe I'll start. Uh, we certainly thought about that over the last couple of weeks. I, I think that's something I would like to throw to the task force to, to consider. I think from my perspective, the big question for me is what, what is the role? What is the jurisdiction? What is the resources? Um, we have a lot of people talking about the concern. So I would really want to know what that person's sort of mission would be. How would, how would they you know, go about doing their business, what would be the intended outcomes. And, and we thought that would be something that this task force should consider in one of its earlier meetings. That's the kind of thing I think would be best considered by them, uh, is right. what I was thinking. Because yeah. I guess, you know, we have a lot of people working on this and we, and we still have coordination issues. So is adding one more office the right thing to do? I'm not saying yes or no. I just, I think we yeah. need to think about it more. And I think that's something for the task force to consider. Great to hear that, that you're thinking about that, and, and maybe I, I, if you haven't received a copy of sort of some of the, the ideas behind it, I, we can share that and make sure you have access to that. That's what, what some have sort of pitched. Uh, well, good. Well, if that's uh, if that's going to be a conversation with the task force, that, those are all my remaining questions. Thanks, Mayor Sophie. Thank you, Councillor Nan. Councillor Stevenson. Great. Thank you. I won't dwell on this too much longer. Just going to the idea of acting as a lender. So we've, we've talked about, uh, you know, in the report, it talks about acting as a lender for affordable housing. What, what would be the funding source for that most likely? Is that sort of the reserves and working capital funds? So I think anytime you lend, um, we, we would absolutely need to identify a funding source. If we were to own buildings, we can borrow from the province, uh, but we can't borrow money to lend money um, other than for not-for-profits. So there, there are spaces where we can make loans work and be a lender, um, but just being a broad-based lender, uh, we would struggle to find the funding to do that. Well, and again, I just wonder, do we... Do we act as a lender or do we invest in local real estate? So again, I'm just looking at the the uh, investment report from 2022 and our balanced fund. We have 5% of our 820 million in real estate investment. 
So again, is there a way that we frame that as investment in local real estate that helps us achieve some of our other goals in terms of affordability and housing? I don't I don't think so, Councillor. When we so when we look at those funds, we spend time making sure that the asset mix, so the asset mix is determined by policy. It's informed by an asset liability review that looks at the risk associated with the um, the money that were the original intention of the money that we're investing. And so when we say real estate there, it's got a very specific meaning and it isn't local real estate. Local real estate would significantly change that risk profile. We'd have to take that back and do quite a bit of work to determine what that would do to the asset, uh, the mix of assets that we're investing in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then I'll, okay, so so I think that's helpful. Um, I'm just remembering we do have another report coming uh, sort of around uh, different funding sources for downtown office conversions. Is that correct? Do we, that's still coming this quarter, I believe? Yes, that's coming this quarter, but it was focused on the CRL for yeah. downtown. And then are we, and, and apologies, as part of that, are we also looking at potential property tax uh, deferrals for purpose-built rental? There is another report on that as well. Okay, coming this quarter? Yes, March, I believe are the dates for that. Okay, so so perhaps uh, that's for me to do a bit of work in advance of those conversations, but appreciate the, the discussion today. Um, just uh, flipping back to some of the other recommendations. So I'm very excited by the idea of looking at shifting some of our municipal reserve allocation for community services um, reserve. It does reference potential funds in lieu. Um, that would that funds in lieu is something I would be I would be cautious or concerned about. I think it detracts from the idea of having a land base in which to provide affordable housing in each neighborhood. So just wondering wondering if there's some thoughts on that. I'll start and Crystal, if there's more to add, feel free to add to that. I think um, there we were just exploring options um, and identifying different ways to deal with um, whether it be land or, or um, budget that we can acquire to focus on housing. So taking less municipal reserve, um, establishing cash in lieu to be able to do something uh, focused on housing would be um, something that could be explored. We could also take it as land too, though. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And that would be consistent with uh, the C six hundred one goal. So I think I think Councillor Stevenson, your your suggestion would be consistent with our policy, which is trying to get housing in more neighborhoods than one. If we tried to err on the land side over the funds and lieu, but to uh, Ms. Petrin's point, we were just saying there's a variety of options available, um, and we were just identifying that variety. Great. Okay, thank you. I think I'll speak to this, but no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. Councillor Rice, can you take the chair, please? Councillor Rice? Oh, sorry, my, <laughs> my Mac. Yes, yeah, chair is taken. Thank you. Uh, one big barrier, Andre, for affordable housing, social housing, is just depend on support from private sector, sorry, non-profit, but also three orders of government. And funding doesn't align at the same time, right? It takes years and years sometimes to put the funding together, then it significantly delays the project. Uh, would conversation uh, uh, under all these 48 actions that you have identified, is? Are we going to have that conversation or opportunity for that conversation with other funder, funders? Like, how do we, funding does come, right? It's not that it doesn't come, but it takes a lot of time for it to come through, right? So maybe conversation around uh, uh, streamlining that process where, you know, all parties are aligned at the same time, you go ahead and do it, right? I think that would be great, <laughs> Mayor Sohi, and uh, I, I don't think we should give up on that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, 
it has been a significant challenge to align three yeah. orders of government into making decisions at the same time and on the same budgets and yeah. um, some of that's just the nature of you know different financial years different budget commitments different times to announce budgets yeah. and and then politics but uh, yes that would I th be I think initiating that helpful. conversation because I think all parties are interested in reducing red tape right and um, yeah. You know, funding is allocated to certain under certain portfolios, but the application process itself is just too yeah. cumbersome sometimes. That it gets, and and I would say the exact same it holds true for transit funding, yes, and yeah. infrastructure funding yeah. and road funding, mm -hmm. and you know when we, when we do, for example, a rescoping of of LRT, it can take us six to eight months to get confirmation from the other partners that that's okay to do right yeah so yeah it's tough and uh, it applies to all forms of funding I would say yeah yeah it does and something that we should actually initiate some conversations around yeah that's the only only question I had remaining uh, thank you for this really appreciate it uh, I will take the chair back okay. and I'll go to Councilor sure. Rutherford Thank you. I just had a couple more questions on the list of actions, and I guess this one is to Ms. Petron, I believe, around um, the expedite, expedite City Efforts Point 2. It says, ask the government of Alberta for a ministerial order to rezone and remove the municipal reserve from surplus, surplus school sites to accelerate the development. Wouldn't, like, and maybe I'm not understanding it. Why can't that come to council as a wholesale package? Councillor Rutherford, that's definitely an option. That's how we would normally do that process. Um, again, some of these ideas, we're just looking to see how we could move very quickly. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm naive, but I don't, I, I don't feel like, do you think that you would be able to, like, is there hope that that would... I just, I don't want you to try to do a ministerial order and at the same time, we're not working towards that coming to a public hearing, nor do I want to remove the ability for people to speak. The, the public hearing and, and rezoning are, are an important democratic process. So whether we do it host, wholesale or not, I don't, I don't know. Like, yeah, I'll, maybe I'll just pipe in uh, Councilor Rutherford because I, you know, I debated myself on this one. Th this is... I think a good example of the ideas that are going to come forward when we declare an emergency, like a ministerial order is, is an often a routine thing that we do in emergencies for, for public safety and for other things. So the reason we throw it on, threw it on the list is because of the, the declaration of emergency. And, you know, we, and we, we chatted a lot about that declaration at the time and, and, and it's very clear that it is considered an emergency. And so those are the kind of ideas that you wouldn't get if, if without that declaration. And, and we had other ideas too, that were even, you know, bolder than that, but, but they were not going to make sense. So that's the reason we added it to the list and I'm happy to, yeah, I hope that helps, but you're right. It doesn't mean it's easy and doesn't mean it doesn't create other complications if you act that way. Yeah. Well, and, I mean, <laughs> I guess like between the declaration and now, have we talked to the province? Is there any desire to do a ministerial order? Uh, I, I have not had the conversation, but I think, you know, if it's something we can explore. And it, it's been done in the past for what it's worth, Councillor Rutherford. And, and maybe yeah, it totally I, I guess, to I guess when projects. I looked at the overall list, a, my overall impression was one like there's a lot of things in that list that we've already explored. Am I am I going crazy or is that the case? And maybe this is to Miss Kajenner. Um, I think maybe Councillor Rutherford, the feeling is that your feeling is like there is no silver bullet or one single action you know that's going to create a overnight dramatic shift. A lot of the actions on that list reflect an expand like an expansion and a building upon of like a lot of the good fundamentals that we already have in place, and that just reflects the reality that it's decades to get into this um, situation on a housing front and it's going to take us a significant amount of time to get out so we can go as quickly as and aggressively as possible but it's still you know it's going to take some time to um, address uh, address the situation that council's declared an emergency around mm -hmm. 
but like even like for example like the lending like am I no seriously like am I going crazy or did that not come back as a report about why that wasn't viable I don't think we've I, not since I've been in, the, in this role at least not so not recently have we looked at lending I could be wrong see Stacy put her, her camera on but I, I don't think we've done it specifically on affordable housing at least yeah, I would say we haven't done it specifically on affordable housing, although we've often talked um, and we've answered a lot of questions about lending and the appropriateness of lending in certain situations. Okay, and so then administration is going to go away, take with this list. Are there any that you're removing based on the conversation today? Because there was a few that counselors did highlight or, or or are you going to explore all of them still every everything I, in that list I, th I think the one I heard loud and clearly to take off this list was the one related to uh, reviewing sort of recent decisions uh, for sort of core service type work that was done so uh, that it's pretty clear to me that there was not a lot of appetite for that one counselor so I wouldn't go and will there will the task force have an opportunity to review the next iteration of once these have been flushed out a little bit more, because I just feel like that might be a more appropriate location to have a more comprehensive conversation. That certainly I would see a role of the task force as soon as we have it um, uh, made. And quite frankly, as soon as we have a counselor rep, I think we would include the counselor rep on all those conversations before we come back to council for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So that concludes the questions on this item. All right, so we have motion on the floor now to speak. Okay. Uh, all right, Councillor Stevenson, you move the motion, right? So you're the mover, right? So uh, uh, before I go to you, uh, I'll give chair to Councillor Rice. Yeah, chair is taken. Thank you. I want to thank administration for uh, uh, working very quickly to put together this uh, this list uh, during a time when uh, there was so much other stress on uh, many folks in the corporation due to uh, the incident that happened here at uh, at City Hall. Right. So it's uh, it's really important for us to recognize and acknowledge that, right? At, this, at the time you were, many of the staff members were dealing with their trauma and anxiety around that incident. At the same time, you were all working hard to explore all the ideas that you could put together uh, in, uh, uh, in front of council for, uh, to have an initial conversation. So really appreciate uh, that. I look forward to further uh, conversation on these, uh, uh, all of these ideas, right? And uh, uh, some might be workable quicker, some may more require more in-depth conversation, and some may not work, right? So I think that's something that we have to uh, uh, to explore. But I do appreciate that we, you put everything on the table, right? That is uh, uh, the way you're responding. I also want to stress this point. Uh, I did try to make that point when uh, I was speaking to uh, the motion uh, that I brought forward on declaring housing and houseless in emergency, right? That this emergency has been created by decades and decades of underinvestment in the social infrastructure. So it's gonna take years to fix the problem, right? I think we need to be very cognizant of that. It's, it's a different type of emergency. It's not an emergency created by one event. It is accumulation of society's neglect toward uh, most vulnerable populations and not investing in, uh, in housing and other support systems. So here we are today that uh, those conditions have created uh, uh, this, this emergency. So I'm very aware and cognizant of the fact that it's going to take time to, uh, uh, to uh, but the emergency means putting all your all hands on the deck. What does what what do they say? All hands on deck, right? So yeah, great. Right? So yeah, uh, 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 to solve this, I think a very important point uh, too. So look forward to further conversation and look forward to uh, uh, working with Councillor uh, uh, Rutherford on the on the task force uh, 
and other members as well, and uh, uh, at this, uh, and we'll make sure that we're all engaged in this important work. That all council members remain engaged in this uh, this important work, even at the as we pursue on the on work on the task force. So really appreciate Andre, you and your team for uh, putting this together. Yeah. With that, I'll go to Councilor Stevenson to close. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I really echo the mayor's comments in terms of us you know, putting out a call um, as council with the declaration of the emergency um, and how robustly administration has answered this call. I'm, I'm so heartened by the, the depth of ideas uh, that have been shared. Uh, I think this has, you know, really helped us to heighten and also, you know, tighten up our focus on what we can control and how we can contribute to further our efforts on addressing housing and homelessness. So huge kudos to the team uh, and everyone that contributed to, to this. Um, there were many, many aspects that I'm, you know, so excited about um, and, and to, to avoid another round of question, maybe just speaking briefly to, you know, I think the great opportunity that was discussed earlier for Home Ed uh, to act as a vehicle for a lot of this work that's happening. Um, also really excited by, you know, the idea of an outreach hub uh, thinking of this idea of sort of a reverse delegation process where we can convene those groups and have them upload what functions they want us to do for them um, and support them and, and potentially expand that to mutual aid groups as well. I think with with day services and as a, as a general theme overall too is I think we have a real opportunity to build on what already works. I don't know that we need new programs or new new ideas of how to serve people. I think those ideas are there and I think that they are being delivered um, not with enough resources and that's, that's the role we can really play in terms of, uh, again, building on those successes and scaling up what we know is contributing successfully to this. Um, I think having uh, you know, a consolidated affordable housing inventory is a, is a really exciting proposition. Uh, and just you know, the working with other partners you know, I really appreciate that section and maybe just wanted to highlight a few other areas where I could really see the need for some, some support and some concrete action from our partners as well. And one of those would be sort of pre and post treatment housing. I think that that's gonna be very critical. Um, I would also love to see some funding to reduce the caseload of Housing First workers and potentially expanding that program so that people are supported for a longer period of time rather than the, the two years that exists now. I think, you know, again, not, not detracting from this very comprehensive, very thorough, and very exciting uh, work plan that's in front of us today. You know, I do feel too that um, we can continue to, to think about how we support market housing as well. Again, affordable housing is a role where we have a, a key role to play as an intervener, non-market housing, but I do think we can, we can think more critically as well around how we support the market housing uh, sector, which, is part of the continuum and uh, part of the type of housing that, that Edmontonians need to access. We're already t starting to see some of those constraints and that will have, uh, that will put pressure, that will put pressure on our housing system altogether and potentially push more people into housing precarity or housing, core housing need. So I don't wanna lose, lose track of that and I think we can continue to advance that through some of the other conversations that are coming forward uh, in the coming months. Uh, finally, just wanted to say how delighted I am uh, that Councillor Rutherford has put her name forward to act on the task force. I'm very grateful for her willingness to commit her, her time and expertise to this endeavor and, uh, you know, and thank, uh, thanks to the mayor as well for convening this group. Looking forward to what comes out of that in, in the weeks ahead. So thank you again everyone for the work on this and I look forward to supporting the vote. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson, so please vote. We're just waiting on, oh, we have all 12 votes. Display the votes, please. That is uh, carried. Okay. Uh, last remaining item is 4.6, bylaw 206782 implement clean energy improvement program. 
this was exempted because Consular Salvador had a subsequent, right? For, right. okay. Uh, just give me one second. So this was at the executive committee. So why don't you introduce the item, Consul Salvador, as uh, as the vice chair of the executive committee? Then you can make oh, your sure. subsequent. Then you can make your subsequent as well. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, happy to introduce. So uh, at executive committee, uh, we had a, a pretty good conversation about um, the full implementation of the Clean Energy Improvement Program. This, of course, has been in the works uh, for um, over a year now, uh, scaling up from the initial pilot uh, to, to a full-scale program. Um, so, yeah, what was proposed is um, looking to do $20 million of funding uh, over a four-year period uh, to enable um, additional financing to promote energy efficiency and renewables. So, yeah, that's, that is that, and committee recommended uh, uh, that this move forward uh, and that is what's in front of us today uh happy happy to also just explain the the subsequent um and my intentions to move a subsequent um just looking for a memo that will outline when uh the program's residential funding has been 80 percent allocated so that we can monitor it going forward as i um, expect it will be um oversubscribed pretty quickly given how popular the pilot was uh, so just want to keep tabs on it that's all Thank you, Constance Salvador. So we'll, we'll vote on this first, then we'll go to Constance Salvador for her subsequent motion. Please vote. Oh, sorry, anyone to speak? Sorry, sorry, skipping, skipping up step. Anyone to speak to the motion? Seeing none, so please vote. I, I, uh, excuse me, Mayor Sohi. We, we're just trying to confirm what we're on. We would recommend we move somebody move first reading. Um, oh, yes. Vote on oh, that. yeah, of course. Then of there's course. a recommendation about attachment three um, that also needs to be moved. Okay. And then we could deal with the subsequent. Oh, yeah, this is the bylaw. Sorry. Sure, I can move first reading of item 4.6. Okay. All second. Second. Okay, please vote. Councillor Stevenson moved, I seconded. We have all 12 votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. And Mr. Mayor, I'll move the recommendation from item 4.6. I'll second. Okay. Please vote. We have all 12 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Now, Councillor Salvador. Perfect. Um, so I will move the administration provide a memo outlining when the Clean Energy Improvement Program's residential funding has been 80% allocated. Second. Okay, Councillor Stevenson seconded. You already made the introduction. Yep. Any questions? Seeing none, anyone to speak? Seeing none, Councillor Salvador to close. Nothing further. Okay, please vote. We have all 12 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, we have no private reports. We have no motions pending. And we are adjourned at 420. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to clerk. Thank you so much for assisting us in this uh, this meeting. Really appreciate it. Good. Okay.